Good morning, everybody. This is a public meeting of the Board of Chiropractic Examiners. The date is January 7th, 2020, and the time is 9.06 a.m. Um, if you'd like to earn CE credits for attendance at this board meeting, please see Dixie Van Allen standing in the back of the room. And in order to receive continuing ed credits, you're required to stay for the entire duration of the meeting. The public meeting uh, is located here at the Department of Consumer Affairs Headquarters, 1747 North Market Street, Room 186 in Sacramento. And the board's paramount responsibility is to protect the health, welfare, and safety of the public through licensure, education, and enforcement in chiropractic care. Please be aware that this meeting is being audio and video recorded for live webcasts, so please turn off or silence your cell phones. And we will now take the roll. Mr. Rufino. Good morning. And good morning, and thank you, Mr. President. Dr. Azzolino. Present. Dr. McLean. Present. Frank Rufino. Present. Dr. Dan. Present. Dr. Lickman. Present. And Dr. Paris. Present. We do have a quorum, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And can you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? be my pleasure please stand and place your right hand over your heart ready begin I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all Thank you. At this time, we are going to proceed with uh, the hearing portion of our our meeting, and I'm going to turn the meeting over to Judge Corey Wong. All right. Thank you, Dr. Azzolino. Um, so just as a preliminary matter, um, um, the order I intend to call the matters is um, I intend to call uh, Richard Luce, uh, the Richard Luce matter first, and then I'll call them in order as listed um, on the agenda, with uh, Andrea Bradshaw being second, Lance Mahoney being third, and John, John uh, Craigie being fourth. Um, so uh, for those of you who are representing yourselves, um, I just want to remind you that these are petition hearings and not um, accusation or statement of issue hearings. And so the, the basis for discipline or the conduct that led to the discipline is not the main issue here. So what I'll do is have Ms. Denver, who is the Deputy Ep Attorney General, um, appearing this matter, in this matter, uh, give kind of an overview summary of um, license history and what brought us here. So to that extent, she'll talk about what the basis of discipline was, but she won't go into in-depth as, as uh, she might in an accusation matter or statement of issues. Um, and then it will be up to, uh, turned over to the petitioner to present his or her evidence. So the board's um, main focus is rehabilitation, so really what, hap what has happened since discipline has been imposed. Now, of course, to establish re rehabilitation, it'll be, it may be necessary to talk a little bit about um, what happened in terms of the um, conduct that led to discipline, but I just want to remind everyone that the, that conduct is not the focus of the hearing. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and start with the first matter, uh, Richard Luce. Oh, and one other thing I, as a preliminary matter I forgot to mention is that the proceedings are being uh, transcribed by a court reporter. So after the hearing, um, the court reporter will have a form for you. Um, and so you may, have, may notice on, at the edge of his table, um, there are two tents, one that says Deputy Attorney General, one that says Petitioner. And when he's done with the court reporter sheets, he'll just put the ones um, in the respective piles. So if you just, after your hearing, just have a seat and kind of keep an eye out for um, when he puts the form in the, uh, in the 
um, pile and just grab uh, your form on the way out. And that's in case you want a copy of today's transcript. All right, so let's go ahead and go on the record. We're here on the record before the Board of Chiropractic Examiners in the matter of the petition for reduction of penalty of Richard Luce. It's agency case number AC2016-1079, OAH number 2019-120410. My name's Corin Wong. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings. And uh, to establish a quorum, if I may uh, take a roll call, starting with the member on my right. Dr. David Paris. Sergio Aslino. Dion McLean. Frank Ruffino. Heather Dane. Corey Lickman. And let the record reflect that a quorum is established. And so if I may take the appearance of counsel, starting with uh, the Deputy Attorney General. Deputy Attorney General Karen Denver, on behalf of the Attorney General, pursuant to Government Code Section 11522, representing the people of the state of California. Matthew Fredericks with Winship and Fredericks, representing Petitioner Richard Lowe's. Hey, good morning. Here. Good morning, Council. All right, um, Ms. Um, Denver, if you like, well, I guess uh, first I received the petition packet. Let's go ahead and um, have the notice of hearing marked as Exhibit 1. The petition for reduction of penalty with attachments will be marked as 2. And the decision and order in case number AC2016-1079 is marked as 3. Um, and um, do you wish to move 1 through 3 in for all purposes, Ms. Yes. Denver? All right. Um, Council, any objection to 1 through 3 being admitted for all purposes? No objections, Your Honor. Uh, those exhibits will be so admitted. And Ms. Denver, if you would like to provide your summary, please. Um, thank you. Um, the respondent was issued a license by the board on September 17, 1999. On February 25, 2016, an accusation was filed, and the basis for discipline resulted from criminal convictions that occurred in 2015 for a violation of Penal Code Section 550A6, making a false claim on health care insurance, Penal Code Section 550B3, concealing an event affecting a claim for insurance benefit, Section 550B1, presenting false information supporting an insurance claim, and Business and Profession Code Section 655.5, unlawful charges for clinical laboratory services. The remaining 122 counts were dismissed pursuant to a plea agreement. As a result of these convictions, the, uh, the accusation alleged criminal convictions, convictions of offenses involving moral turpitude, knowingly making or signing any documents which falsely represent facts, and health insurance fraud. <coughs> Excuse me. The respondent entered into a stipulated surrender. Yes, sorry. The respondent entered into a stipulated surrender with $3,830 in costs payable prior to reinstatement of his license, and he has filed this petition seeking reinstatement of his license. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Fredericks, do you wish to uh, give an opening statement, or do you wish to just head right into evidence? Uh, I could a uh, brief, brief opening. Okay, go ahead, whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you, Board, and uh, Your Honor, for having us and hearing our petition today. Uh, petitioner Richard Luce uh, started, was licensed in 1999, uh, started in Del Mar in San Diego, and developed a successful uh, chiropractic practice um, with over 7,000 clients, approximately 7,000 clients. Uh, between 2010 and 2012, he screwed up. Um, he got allegations uh, filed against him for improper billing and um, and he accepted responsibility for his actions. He, uh, he pled in 2015, uh, pled uh, to that matter, paying restitution in the amount of $221,000. Um, did over 200 hours of volunteer work. Again, accepted responsibility. In this matter, the accusation was filed against him um, in an effort to show his, his true remorse and acceptance of what he had done wrong. He uh, signed a stipulated surrender that became effective in 2016. Uh, this year will be almost four years. Um, you know, later this year, obviously, uh, will be four years since that surrender. <clears throat> um, since then, he's continued some volunteer work. 
to 96 units of continuing education. <clears throat> He's attended over 30 seminars. And uh, what's, I think, more impressive is the, the what you'll hear today is that He's remained in the industry as far as not, you know, not practicing chiropractic medicine, but uh, becoming an entrepreneur, an inventor, uh, developing products to help people. Because that's what he got in, in, into this for, was to help, help patients and help people. And he's continued to do that, developing um, uh, different products um, and trying to pivot from, you know, his, his mistakes and trying to make the best out of him, but still remaining involved in the industry. Um, last year, he petitioned for early probation. And he received that, that in uh, May of 2018, um, and then received expungement and dismissal of the matter, um, his, his underlying criminal matter, in uh, August 2018. Um, you, you heard Mr. Los uh, next, but we hope when evaluating the, the factors that, and the, from the guidelines, we hope that uh, you will deem him worthy of regaining the privilege of restoring his, uh, his license. Um, it means the world to him. To restore his reputation with the industry and his family and allow him to help patients directly again and that's what he got into this industry in the first place so thank you all right thank you um dr luce if you'd raise your right hand please do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you will provide in this matter will be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth yes i do okay you may put your hand down um if you would first uh, state and spell your full name for the record please Richard Arlen Los, and it's spelled L O O S. I apologize. Okay, Mr. Fredericks, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. I do have a one exhibit, additional exhibit. I have eleven copies. I don't know if I should just pass them out. What this uh, document is, is is just the Office of Inspector General's December 30th, 2016 letter, um, excluding Dr. Lowe, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Lowe's to uh, for Medicare, Medicaid, um, and for billing insurance. Um, and we'll talk about that later as, as part of his testimony. Okay, so that letter will be marked as Exhibit A. Ms. Denver, any objection to Exhibit A for all purposes? No. A is so admitted. All right, Mr. Fredericks, whenever you're ready. Mr. Lowe, well, when were you licensed to be, uh, as a chiropractor? I received my license to practice um, in September of 1999. Okay. Did you start practicing right away? I did. I graduated chiropractic college from Life West University December 1996, and I worked as a, a, a postceptor where you can work. Is that okay? Okay. Um, so I, I I worked as a chiropractor as a as a, a postceptor, basically when you can work under a mentor. Um, and then when I received my license in September of '99. And you, and you started with zero clients. Well, uh, was your uh, practice successful? I, I yes. And, and initially, you start with nothing. Um, I moved from uh, from the and developed a clinic, and it ended up becoming very successful. <coughs> where I would average about six new patients a week, and I saw roughly probably seven thousand patients over the span of my eighteen years of practice. What's approximately how many clients you've seen? per week? So a typical week in my clinic, I would see anywhere between 150 to 200 patients in that week. And the allegations underneath, we're not going to relitigate anything, but I want to kind of know what happened. It's between 2010 and 2012, there's 
there was incidents that occurred. What happened? So, in in practice, there's many factors uh, that affect health. There's uh, how you sleep, your attitude, um, positive mental attitude, uh, diet, you are what you eat, exercise, use it or lose it, um, and then obviously function, we got to move well. And I was introduced to a uh, immunoglobulin response test that's called ALCAT, and um, I, I was introduced it via my third-party billing company. We had a meeting, and she, the, the gal who was the president of that company brought it in, and I thought, man, this is amazing because if we can identify immunoglobulin response at the cellular level from the inside out, and we doctors know that the end stage of inflammation is fibrosis, and really that epiphany of what we're really trying to help is the negative effect of inflammation, or AKA fibrosis at that point. So this test was introduced to me. I am, I, I, I don't, do anything that I don't first experience with my patients. So I was the first patient. And so I did, and I identified that broccoli was, I was highly sensitive to broccoli. I was the first patient. And I was blown away. I was like, wow. I, for all of these years, I've told my patients to eat broccoli, but yet it could be like me um, that this was causing an immunoglobulin response. And so it, it, it just basically blew me away. So I started studying more about um, the effectiveness of this test. And then I started introducing it to my patients that had some form of uh, digestive disorders. Usually constipation was the, uh, the, the, the medical necessity of why I would uh, prescribe the test. But so this test was performed on roughly, I think it was 122 of my patients, uh, which is a little less than 2% of my, my populace. So it wasn't like I was doing this on everybody. It was only done on um, patients that needed it. And then it was brought to my attention via Blue Cross that it was, um, they, I, I received a demand letter from Blue Cross that stated that I needed to refund all of the money that they paid me and at first I was blown away because I'd, over the years I'd, I'd received letters from Blue Cross saying, you know, state medical necessity for this test and I would write a medical necessity report and then they would issue payment. And so I, in no way did I think we were doing anything wrong. Um, however, it came to my attention via a letter from Blue Cross that in the state of California, it is illegal to profit from a third party laboratory and so we immediately stopped performing the test and it snowballed into um, a, a, a terrible mistake that I accepted responsibility for. I refunded all of the money. I, um, you know, I, I, I faced quite a bit of legal charges and I pled uh, to five counts um, to right the wrong and then um, I went out of my way to, to demonstrate in any way possible that I'm, I'm a straight shooter, that I'm a, I'm a good guy. And I, I paid back all the money and I, I, I did what I was supposed to do. And um, fortunately, the state has reversed the, the five counts to a non-guilty expungement. And here I am today trying to restore my reputation in front of you. and and um, show my remorse and demonstrate it. So you paid restitution, and that was, that was substantial, right? It was too, uh, how much was it? it? It was, I believe, $221,000, which is a lot of money. Um, the test was performed over about three and a half years. So as far as income, at the time, my clinic was doing roughly half a million in, in revenue. So it wasn't the number one driving force of the of the business, but um, it was a factor. It it hurt me bad uh, to pay back two hundred twenty one thousand. That's that's not an easy amount of money to pull out and give back, but I did it. Um, I paid it in full. 
I did two hour, 200 hours of community service. And, um, yeah. What, what, was, what, uh, what did you do for uh, community service? One second, please. <clears throat> so the court ordered 200 hours. And I, I'm a type of human who likes to help people. So what I did is I divided it up into 100 hours of, um, I volunteered for an organization to, um, it was for basically food, it was a food drive to support wives of wounded warriors. And um, I, I happen to be fairly good at marketing um, with, my, with my success of my chiropractic career. And so I spearheaded the marketing campaign for them and worked on facilitating <clears throat> a broader reach for them so that we could gain more donations. And we had a successful run. So that was 100 hours. And then another 100 hours, I volunteered for the North County Junior Golf Association. Excuse me. And when you say North County, is that San Diego County? Correct. It's, it's North County Junior, Junior Golf Association, which is a phenomenal organization that gets kids involved in the game of golf. And I think there's no better sport that tests integrity than golf, because if, if you cheat, you're cheating yourself, right? So it's, um, it's a wonderful game, and I think that kids could benefit from it. I happen to be a golfer myself, and um, it's something I, I truly enjoy. That, that 100 hours I did, I have continued to facilitate that organization, and um, I've built up quite a rapport with, with the organization to, um, I, I enjoy helping them. So it's not like I stopped when I did my 100 hours, I've continued. I, I don't have any documentation of that, but it's, I, I'm involved still. So going back, to, so we talk about taking responsibility. Um, you, you know, you pled to the criminal matter, but and you also agreed to surrender your license, chiropractic for <clears throat> Why did you surrender your license? Well, I made a mistake, and I wanted to show that I accepted responsibility. And I don't think there's a better way of, of showing remorse than to literally fall on your sword and say, I, I don't, I'm not a troublemaker, so can I do everything right to show the board that I am worthy of regaining my license? And it seemed to me that that would be the ultimate um, the ultimate effort put forth so that I could say, hey guys, I, I'm not here to fight. I'm, I made a mistake. I accepted my responsibility. I've paid back everything. I've done everything I can to demonstrate my remorse and that's why I surrendered it as in hope that it would demonstrate that and that the board would consider um, this day when we, when we finally get to this point. So we, we talked about your successful practice. What, what happened to your practice after you surrendered your license? Well, <clears throat> in California, it's illegal to own a clinic if you're not a chiropractor. And I am no longer a chiropractor. So I had to sell my clinic. And I did. I did a fire sale uh, to my then associate, who uh, now is the owner of the clinic. And um, I haven't stepped foot in it. I'm... I'm I just stayed clear of of that practice. The town that I'm in is relatively small, even though San Diego is a very large town. It's a the the beach town of Del Mar slash Solana Beach. Um, you know, a classic example. Yesterday I was at a coffee shop on Cedros, and I ran into two of my ex patients that are like, "Oh hey, yeah." So, um, so I, I I I basically let go of the clinic. So I, I lost. I took a, there's another example of financial um, pain. Whose fault was it? It was mine. And I, I made the mistake. I, um, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I made a mistake and I, I had to show and demonstrate that I've made a mistake. And since surrender, there's been no allegations of misconduct in any form, criminal, Professional, correct? Correct. <clears throat> you maintain your law-abiding citizen. 
prior to this mishap, uh, I've never had a problem with the law. I've never had any anything. I've never been arrested. Um, uh, no DUI, no nothing. Um, I'm a law-abiding citizen. I'm a, I'm a good human, and uh, I care. And so since before and since, there's no, I, I don't, I still maintain a high moral code. And going further, we talked, you know, the, the successful practice with over approximately 7,000 clients, patients. Um, any, ever any allegations of any misconduct with patients? Ever? Never. I never had a complaint, never had an issue, never had um, a problem. Never, there's, I've, I've got a perfect record other than a, a large mistake that I made with this, um, with this, what, the immunoglobin test that I did on those 122 files or patients that I, cases, let's call them, um, that I performed the test. <clears throat> And then it was brought to my attention afterwards that it's illegal in the state of California to to profit from a third-party laboratory. So what the board's been interested in is the rehab efforts, right? And so let's talk about some of those. How many uh, continuing education units have you uh, taken since 19, or 2016? So I've attended 96 hours of continuing education since the um, <clears throat> surrender to basically um, maintain my foot in the door, if you will. I've attended well over 30 uh, events. Let's go there. There's, across the country, there's continuing education events uh, that chiropractors attend, and I own uh, a lifestyle brand that facilitates the well-being of people. The, it started with an orthopedic pillow and then now we've evolved. I've been awarded a patent on a foam roller that has an ergonomic shape to it to protect the spine, but um, foam rolling is designed for uh, fascia release, and us, the, the, the DCs in the room, understand the benefit or the, how fascia can become a factor with something called fasciitis, and it distorts the fabric of the connective tissue. And then I've got a patent pending on um, an inner lattice layer of a weighted blanket, which is um, a really good biohack of, it's called deep pressure therapy, where people can switch their autonomic nervous system into parasympathetics. Um, we have a vibration version of the foam roller, and then we have um, a sphere, which is a trigger point ball that vibrates. And then we also have a, a, a massage gun that I improved upon. And um, so what I do is I take these products to chiropractic offices and to date we've got over 2,000 clinics that support these products and sell them. So I've done pretty much everything I can to maintain being part of the profession and, and provide products that facilitate the profession. Um, I'm, I, I, I was a chiropractor. I chose to be a chiropractor at age 19. I graduated when I was 25. I mean, I'm a, a thoroughbred, natural chiropractor. I was born to be a chiropractor. Um, and so when I surrendered the license, it was, it was a big deal. Um, and so part of why I'm here is I want to restore my reputation. And then the other part is I'd, I'd really like the, the privilege of, of, of what I had. Uh, we talked community service. You said you're still um, working, doing community <clears throat> service, or volunteer work. Correct. I, I volunteer. It's, it's. I wouldn't call it community service. I volunteer for the organization, the, the North County Junior Golf Association, and um, and it's mainly just. I would travel around this this the the county, and um, bring awareness to the organization through the different golf shops and. And that's, I've continued to do that. I, I, um, my current business, I'm all over the place. I, I travel all over the country. Um, but when I'm in San Diego, that's what I do. I, I, I golf and I take the marketing material and the awareness to the golf pros so that they can be aware of the organization. At this point, it's pretty much done. Like, it's, everyone knows me. <laughs> Um, there's, you know, there's over 100 golf courses, but that's that's not that many. But and so they look at 
with the you, you read the guidelines for reinstatement, correct, Doctor uh, Mr. Lowe's? Yep. Um, it talks about community service. You know, you're still working with the Junior Golf Association. Um, you know, why are you, do you have any involvement in doing more or anticipation or? Well, I have a, I have a, a family. I have two children. I have an eight-year-old and an eleven-year-old. They're both boys, and I have a wife that I've been with for uh, twenty-five years. <clears throat> We've been married for eighteen, and we. It's important to to demonstrate integrity and ethics and um, honesty, and I think golf is a great game that that does that. So, my little boy, the eight-year-old, him and I golf. Um, the older one is more into like flag football and different normal sports. And so, with with the you talked about your the products you're developing, and is you travel a lot with that? I do. I um, typically at least once a month, maybe once twice a month, it, I'm at a some form of a convention um, where I'm not representing myself, but I'm representing the brand and and building the the building the network so that the doctors can provide quality products that are well designed that make sense that are needed and um, and it's it's been it's been wonderful and that is my career right now um, and again I'm, I'm mainly trying to restore my reputation is what I'm trying to do yeah, and why I mean well I think it's important I I, um, I uh, it's 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 completing the loop. I've, I've made a mistake. I've accepted the responsibility. I've shown remorse, and I'm trying to um, complete it. I really do miss. It seemed like every day there was a miracle when I was practicing, and I, I miss the miracle. I I don't intend on going back to practice like I did, where I was seeing the volume that I was seeing. But I would love the privilege to be able to practice, and I, it'll be all out of pocket. And yeah, we provided the, the board with, so we part of the rehabilitation factors talks about uh, safeguards to prevent this these problems from happening again. So what safeguards are in place or are we going to, are you going to institute to make sure this never happens again? Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that letter from the Inspector General because it's, it's evidence that I'm, I'm banned. Um, I don't intend on billing, but I can't bill. Um, so that was the big issue: was I made a mistake with um, with this this timeline of when I was doing this test, and um, it, 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 I'll, I'll I'll never bill again. It's that's uh, that that I learned I, I, I learned the hard way that um, that you, you that I have no desire. To, to do that, I would like to practice. I would like to help people, but I, I don't no. I, I don't want to. I want. I don't want to enter into anything with any insurance company. Is there anything else you'd like to provide, say to the board, or discuss with the board? That... I would like to say I'm sorry, and I would like you to understand that I'm a good guy, and I've I made a mistake, and I've done everything I can to accept my responsibility and show um, I think I'm worthy of having my license restored and I would like you to consider it. Nothing further, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Denver, any questions? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> um, you mentioned that you have remorse and you've taken responsibility and you've repeatedly said that you made a mistake and you weren't aware that it was illegal to profit from a third-party lab, correct? Correct. Okay, but do you also take responsibility for the fact that you've repeatedly submitted inflated uh, claims to insurance companies for this test? Yes. Okay, and in fact, you paid $625 for these tests, but billed insurance $7,250 per test, correct? That is how it was billed, yes. And... I guess that's the part that the public would be more concerned about. The fact that you haven't had patient complaints and you've stayed involved in the industry, that's great. But the concern here is honesty and integrity. And just because you're banned from billing, um, why should the board trust you to be safe to practice, considering what you've done um, over a period of time repeatedly? 
I, I understand your point. Um, the way it was billed was there was a, a dollar value per unit of blood that was being tested. So let's just say there was um, 175 individual examinations of blood testing, like let's say broccoli or or tea leaf or whatever. To, you know, and and so the way <clears throat> the 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 third party billing was billing it this way. I have accepted that responsibility because it was billed under my name, um, and it's it, it's it's it was wrong. Okay, so you knew how much you paid for the tests, correct? Correct. We we I don't think we were ever paid what what you stated there. Oh, um, but yeah. claims were submitted by you for that amount. Correct. correct. And as far as being prohibited from billing, um, how long will that last, that prohibition? Uh, I don't know. I haven't, um, I, I have no intent of, of appealing. I haven't appealed and I, I don't intend on appealing what the Inspector General stated. <clears throat> this is more for uh, dignity and reputation is why I'm here. Um, I'm trying to, to demonstrate that I have done everything I can to accept the responsibility and show remorse. And so if you were allowed to practice, you would not accept insurance, is that correct? Yeah, uh, yeah I have no intention of ever accepting insurance again. What if the board were to make a condition of probation that you are not allowed to accept insurance? Would you be willing to abide by that? That'd be great. Would you be willing to comply with a, uh, a probation condition requiring that your billing be audited? Absolutely. And any other probation conditions the board might think are warranted? Yes. So I guess I, I just... I'm still not entirely clear on what it is you're remorseful for. Do you, I understand there was a third party lab involved in this, but are you just saying you take responsibility and you have remorse or do you recognize that you had a part in this? I, I think what I've tried to show is I've, I've demonstrated by doing everything I can to, to, to show that, I, that I'm Remorse is the word. Um, so, what what happened here is there's this, there's a form called a HICFA. Now, I personally have never filled out a HICFA. I had a third party billing service that filled out the HICFA. Regardless of them doing it, it's my responsibility, and I um, I this went on for a period of time, and um, and. I, once I, I once I learned that it wasn't right, we immediately stopped doing it, and then it escalated to where we got to, and I've paid everything back. Um, so, besides payment, I, I, and and my sincere apology, I that's that's what we've done for for remorse. Okay, and just one last question. On the HICFA, is that, are only lab tests billed on that, or are all your services billed on that? In, in my clinic, about 80% of the practice was out of pocket. So 20% of the visits that were being billed to insurance were um, filed on the HICFA back then. Um, and was it normal to have that much of a markup on the insurance claim as you were doing for the ALCAT? No. No, in, in normal chiropr chiropractic isn't covered that well in the state of California with insurance. So um, hence why about 80% were out of pocket of the 20%. But, and that's just a rough number. I'm, I'm not, this is, I'm just, it's been a while since I practiced. But um, so the, let's say of the 20%, less than 2% were being billed of, well, God, it was less than, two percent of my hundred percent of my practice so um. and your intent going forward is not to accept insurance correct okay. yeah 
I have no further questions. Okay, are there any questions um, from the board, starting with the member to my right? I have no questions. Sorry. Um, you said that you attend um, trade shows now and marketing your brand and your your devices. Um, when you're at those trade shows, are you handing out information regarding the development or advertisements for your your devices? And if so, um, on that information, how do you refer to yourself? I'm. <clears throat> I've taken myself away from the brand. Initially, I was, when I was licensed, I invented the pillow back then, and I was presenting it invented by Dr. Rick or Rick Lose. Now we've taken that page out of the marketing material, so I'm not representing it as chiropractic. Uh, it's not the genesis from a chiropractor. It's basically we we. We distribute the features and benefits of the product, not me. Does, does that make sense? Yes. And at this time, um, there is a balance that was due. Has that balance been taken care of? What are your plans there? We were planning on paying it today. So we, I came. I didn't bring a check, but I brought a, car, a credit card, and I was hoping to pay it today. I have nothing further. Thank you. You're welcome. No questions, Your Honor. I have, I have a question. So when you say that the testing you did was 2% of your patients, but if there was a reimbursement of $220,000 over a three-year period, I mean, that that would account for $70,000 a year in income. So my question is, it, you explain that the third party was filling out your HICFA forms and billing them. Um, my question to you was, when you had a jump, a huge jump like that in your, in your income, um, did you notice that? Did you, I, I, I think I have the same question that the deputy attorney general had about the third party billing it and you didn't know? No, we, we identified it. I mean, it was it was being performed. It, it, I believe it was almost four years of, of this, this period where we were doing the immunoglobulin response. Um, and about half of the tests were done via another practitioner in my office. And, but it was billed, everything was billed under my license um, because I was the owner of the clinic. So it's not like I, because, you know, that money would be distributed throughout the, the, throughout the clinic. Um, but it was all under my umbrella. Um, my business back then, every year, grew. There was always growth. So we would see a, a rise in income every year up until... Um, the day that I left, um, and okay. so, so I guess the answer is yes. I saw revenue, um, but it it wasn't like you know we were probably doing half a million seven. I think my peak was seven hundred thousand, and so if you look at the the yes, there was money. I was a successful practitioner. But um, financially, that is. Um, but it wasn't like, like, oh wow, I got this huge amount of money. That, like, it, it was relevant. I'm not saying it wasn't. It's a substantial amount of money, but it wasn't. Um, it, I, I'm thinking back on how many cases I didn't get paid on, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And yet I paid out, right? And, and so okay. it's, it, it, was, it was a busy time, I'll put it that way. 
Okay. I, I was a very busy practitioner. I, I have one more question. So I know that you are barred from participating, and even you say even if you aren't, that you don't plan on doing insurance. So in regards to your rehabilitation, um, what kind of rehabilitation have you done for the underlying cause of your discipline, which is fraudulent billing? I noticed that continuing education, you have you know, ethics and boundaries training, but no real coding and billing. And I understand that you don't plan on doing that, but it is the underlying cause of your discipline. And if you are put on probation, and when you're not on probation anymore, we, you know, we don't have any influence over whether you bill or not. So what kind of rehabilitation have you done to the underlying discipline as far as ethical coding and billing? So I was, I, I was, I've thought about this on how to demonstrate this. And besides the continuing education, <clears throat> I really couldn't think of anything that to, to, to demonstrate, um, like, with the billing and coding, right? And the, part of it was the, the no desire. I, I, I don't want to bill insurance. So I kind of just said, I'm going to stay away from that. Um, I did, however, take an additional two hours of ethics. Um, it, was a, it was actually a really, really good online two-hour ethics um, course. There's like one oddball two hours that you'll see. And um, that, that was really good as far as, because they did talk about the, the, the conduct, ethical conduct, and, and part of it was the billing. And so I, I was educated, and I appreciated it. Um, <clears throat> I kind of even thought that it would make more sense for me to not study the billing. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Because it's like I, I'm trying to demonstrate to you guys that I don't want that. I mean, so why would I want to learn um, more about how that's done nowadays versus it's like just, just can we please just not do that? And that's so I understand the safeguard. The safeguard is with that inspector general, and um, I'm sorry, that's not truly a safeguard because it says. To be eligible for reinstatement, you must regain your license as a chiropractor in the state of California. So once you have a full and unrestricted license, this you can get reinstatement. I understand that you don't plan to, but it's a possibility. Well, I'm under oath, and I'm saying I'm not going to do it. So, I mean, I, I, I have no intention of doing it, and I'm, I'm, I'm under oath. Doesn't that mean I promise that I won't do it? My turn. Hi, Mr. Lewis. How are you doing? A um, couple questions that came up. Who drew the blood in your office? We would have a, a, a nurse that came in that we would, um, we have a treatment room that isn't a typical treatment room. It's, I, it's a room that I kind of use for people who have a spasm. So there's a massage table in there. We don't do massage, but it's basically someone, an area where they could lie down. In that room, we would, we would schedule a, th a, a nurse to come in and actually pull the blood, and then we would FedEx the blood uh, overnight to the laboratory. All right, so you, had, you didn't do any of that? Okay. No, no, no. Is that billing company still in business? I don't know. During the criminal proceedings, it, they, they pled the fifth all the way through, um, and it, so I... I haven't followed up on if they're in business or not. Um, I'm. Uh, it, it was. It is what it is, right? And I. I. It ultimately came down to my responsibility, and that's what I demonstrated here: is that I've gone above and beyond to right the wrong. Okay. One last thing, and this may be a little interesting, but I know you've done, uh, you know, about. It says 30 continuing education seminars over the past few years, 96 CEUs, but it also says in the next paragraph on, on your BCE page 6 that when you attended the continuing education seminars, you attended as a vendor to promote and educate doctors of chiropractic. So those 30 continuing education seminars were those to get 
CEUs or based on what is written here by your attorney that it's to as a vendor so I'm yeah so the the 30 what we're trying to show you there is that I didn't turn my back on the profession that I've stayed involved in the profession I'm not doing it as Dr. Lose I'm doing it as the CEO of a lifestyle brand so we would attend those seminars now <clears throat> As you know, when you go to these continuing education, there's a lot of commingling and there's a lot of lectures going on. So I would sit in on lectures just out of curiosity, right? So not taking credit for the time that I'm spending doing it. But, you know, um, we... Did you go to Life West by any chance? Mm -hmm. No. So we, we had some amazing professors up there. And so, for example, if I could see Murphy... I would see Murphy. Like, I mean, if, if Murphy was at the event talking, any chance you get to <clears throat> to listen to Dan Murphy is valuable. And so I would step away from a vendor and go into the lecture hall and, and listen. Fair enough. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Uh, Fredericks, anything further on redirect? If, if the board was willing to grant conditions of probation, you would agree not to bill insurance, correct? Correct. Correct. And would you also, uh, conditions of probation? Oh, I'm sorry. In addition, would you be agreeable to additional CE credits on billing and administration and billing and additional ethics credits on that? Yes, if, if, if deemed, yes. And... Again, we talked, uh, uh, Ms. Den, is it Dean, Den? D Dr. Dane, sorry. Um, asked about the, you know, the amount of money that we're talking about. Um, and it was, uh, we, we, said we have, he's discussing about 122, and it's in the documents, 122 uh, clients that were given this test that we were improperly billed for. Um, but again, you mentioned earlier that's out of your 7,000 clients, that equates to less than 2%. And you also testified that 150 to 200 clients were per week is what you had? <clears throat> yeah, so a typical week in my clinic was we would see anywhere between 150 to 200 patients, me personally. And, um, <coughs> pardon me. Um, and so when you look at 122 cases of that volume, it's, it's a small number. Nothing further, Your Honor. Anything further on uh, recross, Ms. Denver? No, thank you. Okay, and any final questions by the board, starting with the member to my right? No questions. No questions. No questions. Quick question. Um, <clears throat> just to be clear, I, you mention about the enforcement cost that you're ready and able to prepare it to pay it today by credit card or other um, are you planning on paying it regardless of the outcome yes sir thank you okay uh, closing arguments Ms. Denver do you wish to give a closing uh, Mr. Fredericks? Yes, Your Honor. Whenever you're ready. Again, thank you for having us and hearing uh, Mr. L uh, Lose's petition. Um, it's been, well, it'll be four years this year in August. It'll be four years since his surrender. Um, he screwed up. I think I mentioned in, in the opening, um, he made a mistake. He, even though he had a third party billing, it was his responsibility, it was his practice. Um, when you guys, when you review these guidelines, the factors for reinstatement, you know, you talk about the number, length, and violations. Yeah, the, the, the amount of money is significant. I mean, and he knows it, and he had the, he paid it back, and, and he had the, he lost his practice, but he knows it's his fault. Um, 122 clients out of approximately 7,000 over three 
year period where this was occurring. It's a test he believed in. He t took it himself. He believed in that, that test and the process, but he screwed up. Um, he's never, never had any complaints. The board, this board's never had any complaints about him or the board about patients. He's been a successful. I, I think when he told me the amount of clients he has, 7,000 over the years, I was, I was 150, 200 a week. I thought that was amazing. Um, so a successful career um, that in trying to prove that he accepted fault, guilt, he surrendered his license and didn't fight the uh, board, took responsibility. He got earlier termination of his probation. He got dismissal from the court of the matter. Um, there's no issues prior or, or, or since. He's, con he's continued with the uh, continuing education. Um, and again, I think I mentioned in my opening is that he remained part of the industry. He, he, this is, is what he, he did as a young man, 19 years old, I think he said. Started in the industry, and it's been his passion. And he wants to be back in it. He wants that reputation to be, be like you guys, one of the chiropractors. Um, to, to practice, to help people, to, to find that miracle, to see that miracle on a, on a daily basis if he can. Um, rehabilitation, he, he, he would agree to conditions on probation that he won't bill insurance companies to prove that he won't, the, the safeguards to establish that. He'll take additional continuing education classes on billing if, he need, if needed. He's continuing to serve the community. Um, he's got young kids. He's involved with them. He's traveling a lot, trying to develop his products that are still helping people. Even though he can't practice chiropractic, he's still helping people. Um, so I, I think and I hope that, and he, I'm sure he hopes that he, he did show you that he is remorseful and by surrendering his license, I hope he showed you that he was serious about taking fault for everything. Um, and I, I think with the review of the documents um, and his testimony that we respectfully request that you reinstate his license. And thank you so much. All right, thank you. So the records close, the matter is submitted, and we are off the record. All right. Um, so, Mr. Fredericks, as you probably know, the um, the board will meet in closed session after hearing the remaining uh, petitions to consider this matter, and so and then issue a, a decision at a later date. So, no decision will be um, issued today. Um, and as I mentioned, if uh, after you gather your things, if you just um, have a seat in the audience and wait um, until the court reporter finishes completing his form, and then uh, you're welcome to pick one up um, on the way out. And uh, Mr. Luce, I wish you good luck. Thank All right. You. Thank you. So we'll Thank take you. a short recess while the court reporter um, finishes up this matter and prepares for the next matter. And then. Thank you. So we'll call one matter out of order uh, due, due to a scheduling conflict. And so next I will call uh, John Craig. All right, let's go ahead and go on the record. We're here before the Board of Chiropractic Examiners, uh, Department of Consumer Affairs, in the matter of the petition for early termination of probation of John Craig. It's agency case number uh, AC2014-991, OAH number 2019-120414. My name is Corin Wong. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings. And if I may take the role of the board to establish a quorum, starting with the member to my right. David Paris. Sergio Azlino. Dion McLean. Frank Rufino. Heather Dean. Corey Lickman. Okay, let the record reflect that a quorum is established, and if I may take the appearance of the Deputy Attorney General. Deputy Attorney General Karen Denver on behalf of the Attorney General pursuant to Government Code Section 11522. Okay, and sir, are you John Craig? 
Hi, I'm John Craig. Okay, thank you. All right, so I've received um, the packet from uh, Ms. Denver, and no the notice of hearing will be marked as Exhibit 1. The petition for early termination of probation with attachments is marked as 2. The summary of probation status is marked as 3, and the decision and order uh, is marked as four. Ms. Denver, do you wish to move these all in for all purposes? I do. Mr. Craig, do you have uh, any objection to one through four for all purposes? No. And those exhibits are so admitted. Uh, Ms. Denver, if you'd like to provide your summary. Thank you. The respondent received his license from the board on May 20th, 1982. And the case that we are here on is based on an accusation that was filed. A second amended accusation was filed February 19, 2016. It involved treatment provided to five patients who were ages 74 to 91 years old and included 40 causes of discipline, including allegations of gross negligence, repeated negligent acts, incompetence, moral turpitude and dishonesty, misrepresentation and advertising, excessive treatment, conduct endangering the health, welfare, and safety of the public, practicing outside the scope of the license, failing to refer a patient to a physician. The respondent entered into a stipulated settlement for five years of probation with terms including monitoring of practice, auditing of billing practices, restricting, I'm sorry, restricted practice, and restitution to consumers. His probation is due to end August 21st, 2021, and he currently owes the board $6,608.24 in cost recovery. The respondent has filed this petition seeking early termination of his probation. All right, thank you. And Dr. Craig, if I could have you raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you will provide in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay, you may put your right hand down. And if you would state and spell your full name for the record, please. Pardon? If you would state and spell your full name for the record, please. It's John S. Craig, K-R-A-G-E. I apologize, I'm a little hard in here. Okay, no problem. All right, Dr. Craig, um, if you'd like to uh, begin your testimony whenever you're ready. Uh, the first thing I wanted to uh, remind you is that, as I mentioned um, at the beginning of the proceedings, the, we're not here to relitigate re the um, underlying cause for discipline. Uh, the board's focus is on your rehabilitation. So with that in mind, whenever you're ready. First of all, I'm, I'm really sorry. The time it takes for each of you to be here. Um, to watch over the public and me um, and the time it has taken me to deal with the issues of both family, testing, retesting. The testing on laws and ethics was by far the hardest exam I've ever taken. It was five hours of essay. Um, I'm so sorry. The laws and ethics exam I took was, was harder than my boards. And um, I mean, I, I am able to respond to lots of questions, but to write them out. And as I was doing so, it reflected on my relationship to you, to my family, to my community, to my peers to everyone and in that process of studying for that which we have no studies for at all I looked for everything and so it required a lot of internalizing those concepts having said so um, I grew too fast I had also a very successful business started with just three of us in San Diego and I bought the business out in 93 and in early uh, 2010, we ended up having three or four doctors working for us and um, 25 employees. It got bigger than me. It made too much money and it cost too much money. So the day's end, it was really more headaches than it was really worth it because when you ask the accountant, what did you really make? Um, we didn't make that much. It was really a profound experience. Having said so, we had already built this monster and it got out of hand. Meaning that I had, although I was in control, 
I there were so many loose ends I found myself as was just demonstrated I made a whole lot of errors that I personally was not involved with with treating um, I would do the diagnosis I would do I would do reports of findings but on my day-to-day uh, -day issues that was not going on I didn't take care of that we've lost the corporation almost lost the house and I continue to pay off debt every month um, based on those mistakes. I'm glad to do so. I'm honored that I can. I'm, and I now only practice for myself. I do between my wife and I, that's all we have. We have two rooms. I handle all the things that deal with patients. She deals with the things in the front, and we make sure people get better, and we handle every aspect of that so that we do right for you, for them, for my family. And I have feedback, as noted in this document, every aspect you've asked me to do, I have performed. Um, I, what's not mentioned here is that I hired my wife's, um, her cousin, first cousin, who passed away last year of a massive heart attack. He was a trial attorney, and he became the CFO of the company, and ultimately we lost about $300,000 in equipment and $150,000 cash. Um, that played a role in a lot of the challenges that we have. I choose to tell you that not that, that I'm also responsible for that. I'm the person that hired him. So I'm responsible for that one too. Overall, um, I, in terms of um, business being smaller and we're happier, we still have many challenges that still are involved here, both to you and to me in reporting. Thank you for Christina and making sure I did it right. Uh, it was hard to get used to that. And then to pay back the debts. At one point, we had not enough money even um, to pay back people as they were paying back the person that's noted here. That was all stolen. And I've uh, paid all of that back um, based on the board's um, um, in, in judgment. We're still paying that. We got about 6,000 left. And um, I intend to pay all of it back. Um, there are other debts that I'm still paying back as well outside of this that I went ended up in bankruptcy, and that I'm still paying that back too. I'm being honorable to those debts. I hope to stay in business long enough to pay them all off. And um, service. I, uh, I've been in the Boy Scouts of America for 30 years. All five of my boys, I have eight kids, are Eagle Scouts. I enjoyed saluting the flag this morning. It's not my nature to hear the word fraud. Never has been. Um, I uh, did get in trouble with advertising. I said things that I just thought was cool to say. I didn't understand the laws of advertising. I got reprimanded by the board several times in the beginning. Don't put that in. Okay, I took that out. Don't put that in. I, I did not understand that. And I am very, very concerned about when I say something to someone that they understand informed consent on the front side. And I give them every option never to participate or allow me to be their doctor and make sure that I I help them to understand what their responsibilities are going to be to their own care. So I, I indicate to you that I've learned a lot of lessons. I still provide that kind of service. I'm out of the Boy Scouts of America. Um, I lost my hip uh, last year in November. I had a new hip put in, and so I don't do quite as much hiking. Um, having said so, I've been responsible for my church upwards of 100 families for the last couple of years and providing for 
their needs, meaning that if they had things to fix around the home, we would fix them as a group. Uh, uh, we would do, um, we would organize opportunities for, to serve the people. And I do to this day, I'm presently a Sunday school teacher with my wife. So I, I ask you to uh, receive this petition. I'm just wanting to get my life forward. I'm 68 years old this year. I don't have, in terms of practice, I think that exceeds most in this room. So I don't have a lot left of me, so I hope I can pay off all these tests in that period of time. But to my children, um, it would be important to say that I cleared my name in that I did what was right for the district attorney, and I did what was right for you, and I did what was right for the public. And um, I guess that's all I can say. Great, thank you. Cross-examination, Ms. Denver. Thank you. Um, you currently owe the board uh, $6,608.24. If the board were to grant your petition, um, would you be able to pay that in full? Probably not today. Um, okay, assuming so there, there wouldn't be a decision today, but um, if that's I, what I, I plan on paying it, I, and I will pay every penny. I, I've, I have demonstrated that in all of my bills to the board and to those who we owe. And considering that you entered into an agreement um, based on the allegations against you, you entered into agreement for five years of probation. Um, why should the board, why should you not be required to complete those five full years? I, again, commending you for being compliant, um, but why should they end your probation early? They're under no obligation to do so, and I, nor am I suggesting that there's any compelling reason except that probations and these extenuating circumstances are to establish that a person has changed their life and are not willing to do those things. Are there any probation conditions that you are finding particularly difficult, um, such that if you were to have your probation modified rather than terminated, that would be of a benefit to you? I don't, could you clarify that statement? Yes. What about probation is difficult for you on a day-to-day -day basis? Which of the conditions that you have to comply with? I guess what I'm saying is that you can still, you could still be on probation, but with different conditions than what you have now. There's kind of a medium ground there, and I'm wondering if that's something that would achieve your goals. Or are you just seeking to end your probation entirely? Well, I think clearing my name is number one for everyone. And clearing my name for my children and my grandchildren. And I have 12 grandkids now. We have 12 grand grandkids and um, have been the grandpa is a, that's a big deal uh, for me. And being a good grandpa is even more important to me. So clearing things up is good. Um, in terms of probations and so forth, um, um, I have a wonderful supervisor, Dr. Greenberg, and um, I think it's great that he watches over me and reads my reports and so forth. I, I would like to not have that. You know, I'd like to just go forward and just still just be me. I think I've made, rec I've made. In fact, if you look at my records, he says that I'm far beyond what people do in the community, and I think I've demonstrated that. So as I said initially, I believe that, we're, that probation is to make a difference. And although another year and a half, I, hopefully I can demonstrate based on everything that's in this document, as well as the exhibits, that says I have done that. And I'm asking the board to consider that in terms of early termination. And do you recognize that probation and probation conditions are for protection of the public? It's not to punish you, per se. you understand that? The answer to that would be, do you think I'm going to be different as well in a year and a half from now than I am now? And I don't believe I am. And I'm, I'm suggesting that the board consider that, the, that everything here demonstrates that I'm a different person today than I was then. I don't have 
any of the practice that's anywhere close to that. I have nobody working for me. I work strictly by myself to control everything. Okay. And, and I feel like I've demonstrated that it allows a business to function much more clearly as it should have been. Okay, I have uh, two questions. One, um, without getting into your underlying conduct, um, in your petition and your testimony, you, um, you mentioned that the case arose out of patients who were dissatisfied with their treatment outcomes, and you state that in most cases you didn't do the direct treatment. However, you admit that you personally diagnosed each of the patients in the accusation, correct? I did um, not all of them, no. Well, it was combined with other doctors, as I should, is what I should say. Okay. Well, according to the accusation, which you uh, settled with, um, it says that for each of these patients that you examined and diagnosed each of them. Is that correct? That is correct. And that you uh, recommended and implemented a treatment plan. Is that correct? That is correct. And then I guess I didn't ask this question correctly, but understanding that you're here because you want to clear your name and move on, what assurances can you give to the board that the public will be protected by terminating your probation a year and a half early? The same that I would have a year and a half later. I have no further questions. If time was to determine all extensive, um, I'm more than glad to wait this out if you, that's what the board deems. All right. Any questions by the board, starting with the member to my right? Hi, Mr. Kreitch. Uh, I have a couple questions. Um, my first question uh, regards the main issue for your causes of discipline, which were unnecessary and excessive treatment. I'm wondering if you can tell me your current thoughts, um, and you mentioned that a year and a half from now, you didn't think you'd be any different than you are today. Is, am I stating that correct? Yes, what is the question that you would like about excessive treatment? Um, so uh, I'm wondering if you had any planned or if you have done any sort of uh, continuing education or um, anything that would have changed your thought processes or um, your ability to diagnose and, um, you know, change the treatment uh, plans, frequency, duration of care, et cetera, which seem to be one of the major causes of uh, The discipline. majority of the work that I do today is chronic disease, chronic inflammation, um, and depending upon the individual's participation, it really relies not just upon myself, but upon the individual to participate. Um, most of my programs now take uh, about three months to get through. Um, and in those things, I spend an hour with the patient every week for the first two weeks to, to establish what it is that is necessary for them to overcome different inflammatory processes. If it's a neuroma, neuromas normally that are, are an aberration of an inflammatory nerve, intersegmental nerve between the toes or digits, uh, they don't come there in a day and they don't go away in a day. And so most of those things that you're seeing that, uh, that we look to as being um, uh, excessive, well, uh, not having surgery that would cost 20 grand not to include rehabilitation, I find that if that's able to re remove the irritation and absorb the, the scar tissue, and that happens in most cases, I don't look to that as being uh, the problem. In most cases, it does resolve if you do help the mechanical component, the nutritional component, um, most of those will disappear. Having said so, if a person doesn't give up their drinking and doesn't give up their lifestyle, it makes it very hard. So I'm not sure that's a little vague, but the answer is, is if it's chronic and you can address the issues of chronicity, both environment, food, nutrients, and mechanical, in most cases, those things will resolve in time. How long? Some just a month, and others can take upwards of six months. 
And would you, uh, are you still using laser therapy in your office? I do. As a, okay. And so uh, am I correct in understanding that in general, when I hear three months, um, it seems like previously you were recommending three months. The In general, the frequency, duration, the overall treatment plan, length, et cetera, has remained relatively the same. Even, the treatment even protocols for chronic disease, yes. If, if I was just doing adjustments, no, I don't do adjustments. I, I don't have a shoulder and body that does that very well. So most of mine is nutritional and chronic inflammation. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Craig. Good morning, Sergio. Um, so my understanding is you've been in practice about 38 years. Yes, sir. And, and when did you start taking on neuropathy as your main thing? It wasn't ever a main thing. It was really the whole foot. So I've taught well over 100 doctors how to deal with the foot. And so I was a, a doctor's doc. So I taught them the... Uh, and I, I've studied under A.O. Logan. So there's the mechanical component that, uh, that the foot goes, on, goes through, which is called pronation, and overpronation is one of the number one diseases of the foot. So I started addressing it primarily. Um, I made my first uh, set of orthotics and so forth back in the 80s and actually created my own uh, kind of a pro protocol to deal with, with the foot. So I've been dealing with chronic foot disorders since uh, the mid 80s my understanding is you are addressing neuropathy also is that correct i adjust the foot not neuropathy uh did you advertise for neuropathy i don't um with the laser there was I no don't. i used to okay do that. i've given you all the board all of my advertising over the last couple of years not one is there in there that talks about laser okay so i'm sorry um my question maybe i, I didn't state it well when did you start advertising that you treated neuropathy with the laser Probably prior to this time, before we lost everything, we were doing advertising back then that we would treat the foot and we would use the laser to treat multiple conditions, including um, degeneration of the first hand P joint, which is called a bunion. We would treat neuropathy. We would treat plantar fasciitis. We would treat Achilles tendonitis. And all of those conditions are primarily uh, gait disorders that can be properly treated. And are you still treating neuropathies? I don't. I don't treat neuropathies. In fact, I don't. Uh, I don't advertise for it. But they show up occasionally. And I have a, a one patient right now that does have some uh, neuropathy. But I don't treat for neuropathy. I just treat the the mechanical component of the foot. Okay. And what are you suggesting patients that do have neuropathy and do? Well, they they first get a full examination. We check for motor and sensory deficits. We then um, uh, go through a gait evaluation. Um, then we will normally do a casting procedure of the foot to hold it in, what, not pronation, but uh, in a neutral position. We then go through a rehab program to, to help that foot, the muscles that are involved, strengthening the muscles that are involved. And, um, and then they also go through a nutritional component. And how about if this pronation or any of the atrophy in the foot is secondary to neuropathy? How are you handling that? Well, if the neuropathy comes from a proximal lower motor neuron syndrome, that's a very hard one because now we have a back that's involved. And so if the back is involved and there's nerves there, then that must be treated as well. If we focus just on the foot and neuropathy, there, we find that if it hasn't been um, the surgeries show that about Dr. Gonzalez's study shows about 50% of those with uh, neuromas will come back. If you change the gait mechanism and there's not as much scar tissue, I find that about 80% of them resolve. That hasn't been my experience at all. As a board-certified chiropractic neurologist, I, I uh, deal with neuropathy regularly, and I find that you're isolating your your understanding of the foot to a very very minimal aspect looking at bunions and, and looking at pronation. So my, my concern is quite simply in patient management, which I believe uh, we're here to discuss given your, your wish for reduction of pronation or reduction of your probation. Do you have any safeguard measures in place on how to manage these cases when they come through? Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Do you have any 
safeguard measures in place on how to handle these situations should a patient come to your office, have foot pain, have some sort of neuropathy? Do you have any other measures, uh, any other sources that you deal with besides casting, making orthotics, nutrition, and using laser? Well, obviously, if it's a neuropathy secondary pernicious anemia, that would be another problem. If it's a neuropathy secondary to a diabetic neuropathy, that would be another problem. In most cases, I won't accept those cases. I'll refer those out to you or somebody else. I will primarily focus on the ones that do respond to the mechanical component that I described. And frankly, only 1% of my practice is anything, anything close to that at the present time. So okay. it's a very, very small portion. Thank you. My, my question, I, I'm still trying to get a better understanding, and please understand uh, that we're here for patient protection. These individuals that came to see you, did you have a method of screening them to make sure they did not have diabetes, make sure they didn't have Charcot-Marie tooth disease, make sure they didn't have a uh, polyneuropathy multiplex or anything of the sort? Every patient that comes through my office gets a $3,000 blood test. Every single And what are you checking on that blood test to rule out Charcot-Marie tooth disease? So, I don't test for a spirochete or some sort, some sort. But the answer is, is that as we do the, the evaluation of the foot, I don't, again, 1% of the time, but everyone gets a blood test that tells me if they have a di they are diabetics. It'll and tell me if they have a CBC problem. It'll tell me if there's other problems involved, but every single patient gets that. And please help me understand, what are you checking in that $3,000 blood test specifics? Well, first of all, I give it to them at my cost, which is only 250 bucks. but if they go out and get it on their own, that's about what it costs. And what are you checking for that? Um, I do everything from glucose, A1C, homocysteine. I check all the um, ALT, AST. I check the thyroid for any type of problems with thyroid. Ultimately, the, the treatment protocol is number one to our, our abilities to help people is oxygen, number two is glucose, number three is thyroid, and number four is digestion. If we can handle those things, we can help them in almost every aspect. So CBC with a comprehensive metabolic panel, which looks at ALT and glucose and HA1C, and a thyroid panel um, through professional co-op is about 100 and. $59, maybe $189 to put a vitamin D on top of that. It uh, brings it up uh, just a bit. So I'm not clear on what is the $3,000 test that you're running. If they were to buy it if they buy themselves in the retail market, that's I've had, I treat medical doctors and they ask me how I got the test. They said it would cost them $1,900. So I'm just giving you the information they have given to me. Uh, that information is grossly incorrect. So I have no further questions. Uh, good morning, doctor. <clears throat> I just have a couple of questions. Um, just a little more uh, elaboration on the blood work. So you're you're doing these blood panels, and what happens when a patient's blood panel shows you that they are diabetic or have other, um, whether it's autoimmune or any other um, chronic disease illness? What do you do then? In most cases, they already have a doctor that is, um, is helping them. They're usually an endocrinologist that's put them on metformin. Um, my, my value is to give them some other options with diet if they would like to utilize that. And then in conjunction with their doctor, they would have to follow up on that. If it would change their blood sugars, they would have to change their medications through their doctor. So you're telling me that you check to see if they're being managed by their doctor or... You assume that they're being managed by no, another every, doctor. No, every history establishes what it is that's brought them to this point. So we, are, we establish who's involved with their care and what medications are taken and why they're taking them. And how do you verify that? You just take the patient's word for that, or are you verifying that? Well, they fill out an exam. They fill out a form. My initial forms is about five pages long. It talks about... Um, um, all the symptoms that they're having, past history, past surgical history, symptoms they're having, what things that are really bothering them. And then at that point, we're able to make an assessment with the blood test to establish what's really going on there. If they are on medications, their heart doctor has to watch them for their heart medications. If they're diabetic, they have to watch those. Occasionally with the nutrients, they have to watch them closer because they start to change. I understand that their medical doctors have their position and establish what they should do, but my question was, what do you do 
um, to follow up on that. Well, if they're eating potatoes and are diabetic, I'll usually recommend they don't use that. I'll usually go to a lower glycemic diet, higher with more of a ketogenic approach than I would with more of the starches that are being offered. Um, uh, also, what do you consider excessive treatment? Well, excessive would be something the patient doesn't want to do, and it's really not leading to a solution. Uh, so to objectify what you're doing, and every week they have to fill out uh, a four-page form. I do blood sugars. I do uh, oxy oximeter, which is their oxygen capacity. I look at their pulse. I do blood sugars. And they have to keep a record of that on a weekly basis. I do blood pressures twice a day, every day. So they bring back a record that gives me an evaluation of what their subjectives are. And they also evaluate what their blood sugar is. Because we find that, sort of, for example, if you had a potato and your blood sugar went to 160. I'm sorry. So if your food then brought your blood sugar up to, say, 160, then that food very likely would not be good for you. If you had, and then if you could monitor that and bring it down, it's going to help your diabetes. So in your opinion, excessive treatment is treat, any treatment that's not working if, if that subjective, if the subjective is infectious, so we do, we do initial blood work, we do medium, we do it halfway through the program at the end. What is halfway at the pro through the so program? That, and most of our patients are done. I get fired in about three months. So at the end of that program, they do one at the beginning, one in the middle, and one at the end. And invariably, about 90% of them, based on their dietary choices, change the inflammatory. You can see it in the subjectives. They all go down. And as a result, their care is improving. They're very happy with response, and then they're released from care. I have nothing further. Thank you. No questions for me. Hey, doctor. Um, my question is is about, you know, a lot of the stuff that came through was, you know, the amount of care that was being done for the patients and, and the excessive care and, and uh, the financial capabilities of those patients and refunds, et cetera. What fees are you are you you're putting people on packages right now? I assume. Well, they're uh, they're variable packages based on disease and so forth. Yes. So prepay packages. Yes. What's a per visit average for you, if you don't mind me asking? Probably two to three hundred dollars. <throat> and what are you doing in each visit? I spend one hour to an hour and a half with each patient. Doing what? So we go over all of their subjectives that we've just said. So they have to yeah. answer two pages for their right. their gut and two pages for their brain, and then they write down all the foods they eat for a week. We first of, we handle any subjective complaints that they have over the past week that they're not responding to or they don't feel better with. We then we then look to their subjectives to find the areas of complaint that the body is not responding to. So, for example, if you had a gastrointestinal problem like heartburn, you can either take a PPI or you can handle that with diet. So there's different things that we can do, like aloe vera and that kind of stuff to handle that. If you can get down the subjectives and they're digesting their food. Oh, I get that. What I mean, you're using laser or you have an associate use a laser on these patients as well, doing treatments? I use That's... laser less than 5% of the time now. Okay. Most of it's done with just, an, uh, and in fact, I don't, I adjust only 5% of the time. So majority of your practice is consulting? Is consulting and nutrition. Okay. Thank you, Doc. No questions. Okay, Dr. Craig, is there any, anything you would... I, I have some oh, Okay, go ahead, Doctor. Oh. Can I ask one further, please? Uh, Ms. Dr. Craig, can you, can you tell me any commonly accepted outcome assessments that you might be using? in your office? In other words, start of care, middle re-evaluation, or something that allows you to justify a release from care? Based on objectives? Um, outcome assessment tools, so do you I use, use any? I use blood evaluation. 
and I use their subjectives. And if I, in, if the subjectives are showing that they're going down, and the evaluation by repeat blood tests show also that there's correction, which happens well over 80 percent of the time based on dietary and nutrients, and the patient's happy, the, the greatest value I have is that I see people get control of their lives, and they're compelled to have to reduce some of their medications with their doctor to accommodate that. But other than the physical exam findings and the subjective, do you use any formal outcome assessments, quality of life measures, um, functional ability, et cetera? I believe that every because I do it every week, there the way that I approach it and get the uh, information objectively, both by way of blood pressures, by way of uh, I'd use an oximeter for their pulse and oxygen saturation. I also use a glucometer. I test it four times a day. So when I see all of those m markers and their blood tests resolving, plus their subjectives then are virtually eliminated, and the patient's happy, I think I've helped them to help them that in that way. I believe they have an objective. Uh, uh, in fact, they've proven to themselves that they're own, their own best doctor. They don't need me anymore. Understood. Thank you. Dr. Craig, I have a couple more questions here. What do you expect to see on the um, pulse ox when you say things are resolving? Well, a lot of things that I see a lot of times is the heart pulse is going, um, I see oxygen saturation down and heart pulse is up. Now, that's not a conclusive thing. It just helps me to give an indicator, as all things are. It's a one moment in time to look at glucose. A blood test is a one moment in time. Now, an A1C is, is more. It's 120 the average of the red blood cell. But for the most part, you're getting a one shot in time to look at things. So if I see that there's a low thyroid or there's low, uh, the glucose is too high and so forth, you put that all together and the, the puzzle seems to demonstrate where the major areas are. But the real, the real work is when we have them go out and do a, their daily assessments of what's going on in their own lives. I find that by giving them the responsibility to do that homework, they become um, self-reliant and they don't need me anymore. They really understand how to focus on their foods and diet to really get it controlled. So my question was based on the pulse ox specifically. Yeah, so I'm saying if your pulse is up, there's several reasons. They could have just had a cup of coffee. They could have just ran up the stairs. They could have smoked a cigarette. Um, uh, they could have an anemia. They could um, have, uh, you know, multiple different things. It's my job to make sure exactly kind of what, what the indicators, what, what's causing that. I guess I should clarify that. On oxygen saturation, how often do you see oxygen saturation change? All the time. You can just leave it on the finger. It'll be changing right there in front. And of you. what numbers do you generally see it change to? Well, the, most of the literature shows that anything below 94 is something that you should be concerned about. Um, uh, you're, you're still fine there. Um, my job is to make sure we have optimum health. So I much prefer that it's above 94. Um, if I find it down in the 80s, then uh, we're really concerned. What are you concerned about? Oxygen. Specifically, any conditions? Well, if you have a, a well, there's mul multiple things. You, know, you could have COPD. So you could have asthma. You could, anything that would stop oxygen saturation that's not getting into the blood, and if you don't get oxygen in the blood, we're going to have a problem there. Okay, and then you also mentioned uh, you look at gut, two pages of gut. Are you doing any objective testing for gut health? Um, most of that is subjective, and then what we do is we run a lot of antibody testing. So I followed uh, Dr. Karazian's work and Dr. Uh, um, Vajani, um, Aristo Vajani's work, and we find that there, if they are showing antibodies, say, to transglutaminase 2, there's a very good sign that there might be celiac. If it's transglutaminase 6, it can be neurological. So we look to the antibodies that tell us that uh, reactions going on in the system can definitely be systemic, not just... So know, are you running these tests? I do. Which uh, lab are you using? I use Cyrex. Okay. And lab, are you... Primarily, 100% of my testing is LabCorp. And then where we find that there's antibodies, then we find what, what it is that's inflaming that. All inflammation then can be dealt with you know, foods and nutrients that help them to get, get control of that. And are you doing abdominal exams? I do. I palpate. Do you auscultate? I do auscultate, see if their bowel sounds are there. Any auscultating lungs? 
I was going to take the lungs and the heart. Okay. Thank you. No further questions. Okay, any further questions by the board? All right, seeing none, uh, Dr. Craig, anything further you'd like to say on redirect? No, I, I felt uh, towards the end of this, I felt, uh, you know, I feel good we're all here. I feel good that we're all trying to do the right thing. I am. I work really hard at it every day. I know you do too. I feel terrible that I've made you be here. Having said so, I believe I'm really doing a good job for people. I see it in, in their lives. Um, do I still make mistakes? I do. Not the ones that we described. But I'm not a perfect dad. I'm not a perfect doc. And I still make mistakes. I just want to get forward and know that the big ones that I, we've described here today that were multifactorial. It's not just me. And it's not just you. And I hope you feel like giving you enough information to say, I really do protect the public. Very few doctors do that. And I hope that helps you to understand how I need to get this behind me, I hope, anyway. Thank you. Ms. Denver, anything further on recross? No, thank you. Okay, and lastly, any further questions by the board? All right, seeing none. Um, Dr. Craig, is there any other evidence you wish to submit? I wasn't prepared for it. I, I appreciate a neurologist in front of me. They can ask me a lot deeper questions, but I wasn't totally prepared for all that. Okay, so closing arguments. Uh, Ms. Denver, do you wish to provide one? No. All right, Dr. Craig, uh, your closing argument. I think I kind of just did. I hope that you, uh, if you feel like I'm going to need to do the year and a half more to make sure that I'm a better person, I'll do it. Okay. Uh, if you feel like I've learned enough lessons here in terms of where we're at and where we're going, I know that you asked very specific questions against it, but if I was just seeing you and I felt you needed the care and you wanted it, you agreed to it, I would still extend the care to you as long as you wanted me to be there. And if it took us 40 visits or 50 visits, I would do that. And if we got it done in 10, I would do that too. It's not about time, but it is about, I'm, I, I've been doing this a lot. I spend 50 to 80 hours a year with these graduates from Harvard and UCLA to become a better doctor. I work very hard at it, and I hope you understand that I really focus on the patient. I don't care how smart I am. I care about them getting smarter themselves. And I hope that you see that I, I hope that we can raise the, the value of care more so for all of our doctors to protect them. And, and I believe many of the things that I'm doing, not to, not to what I used to do as an adjustment, which is still an essential component. I'm just getting worn out to do it all. But we need to also focus on many of the things related to gut and autoimmune disease. Number one killer to a woman today is heart. Number two is stroke. Number three is autoimmune. We really need to take more attention to those things that, are, that our, our scope of practice allows us to do so. And I, hope, and I hope you see that I'm trying to do that as well. That's all. All right, thank you. So the matter submitted, the record's closed, and we're off the record. Uh, so Dr. Uh, Craig, after you gather, gather your um, belongings, if you'd have a seat in the audience, um, the court reporter will finish up his form and then um, you're welcome to take it on the way out, and that's just in case you want a copy of uh, today's record, right? And I wish you good luck. Okay, thank you. Thank All right. You for me to be here. So we'll take a short recess while we, um, while the court reporter finishes uh, with this matter and starts with the next. The next matter we'll call is um, Andrea Bradshaw. All right, so we'll uh, proceed with uh, the Andrea Bradshaw matter uh, now. Uh, so let's go ahead and go on the record. We're here on the record before the Board of Chiropractic Examiners, Dep 
Department of Consumer Affairs, uh, State of California, in the matter of the petition for reinstatement of Andrea Bradshaw. It's agency case number AC2014-999, OAH number 2019-120406. My name is Corin Wong. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings. And uh, if I could call roll to um, establish a quorum for the record, uh, starting with the member to my right, please. David Paris. Sergio Azlino. Dion McLean. Frank Rufino. Heather Dane. Corey Lickman. And let the record reflect that a quorum is established. And if I could take the appearance of the Deputy Attorney General. Deputy Attorney General Karen Denver on behalf of the Attorney General pursuant to Government Code Section 11522. Okay, and ma'am, are you uh, Andrea Bradshaw? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, and as I went over at the beginning of the proceedings, um, this is uh, the hearing on your petition, and so um, if you would just keep in mind when you testify later that the focus is on the board's focus is on rehabilitation and not the underlying grounds uh, for discipline. Okay. okay, and I have the petition packet, uh, Miss Denver, and we'll go ahead and mark the notice of hearing as Exhibit One, the petition for reinstatement with attachments as Exhibit Two. The decision and order in case number 2014-999 as Exhibit 3, and the decision and order in case number 2008-631 as 4. Um, Ms. Denver, do you wish to move these in for all purposes? I do. And Ms. Bradshaw, any objection to any of the exhibits for all purposes? No. And all four exhibits are admitted for all purposes. Um, Ms. Denver, if you'd like to provide your summary, please. Thank you. The respondent was issued a license by the board on January 29, 1996, and the license was surrendered effective October 8, 2015. Um, the respondent was initially placed on probation effective January 6, 2012, as, a, as the result of an accusation that include uh, allegations regarding the treatment of 12 patients and included causes for discipline for gross negligence and incompetence, repeated negligent acts, failure to refer patients to physicians, failure of proper documentation, fraud, failure to ensure accurate billings, insurance fraud, excessive treatment, and acts of moral turpitude. At that time, uh, she entered into a stipulated uh, settlement with the board and was placed on five years probation, which included a 30-day suspension, a requirement to take and pass the ethics examination, and to reimburse the board uh, its costs of $22,271.50. A accusation of petition to revoke probation was filed on June 6, 2014. In addition to various probation violations that were the basis of the petition to revoke probation, the basis for the accusation was incompetence, repeated negligent acts, unlawfully waiving patient's responsibility to an insurance company, failure to properly display license and obtain satellite office certificates, insurance fraud, excessive treatment, false advertising, and other allegations. Um, at that time, the respondent entered into a stipulated surrender with $22,271.50 in costs payable prior to reinstatement of her license, and she has filed this petition seeking reinstatement of her license. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bradshaw, if you'd raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you will provide in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, thank you, and you may put your hand down. If you would uh, please state and spell your full name for the record. Andrea Bradshaw, A-N-D-R-E-A-B-R-A-D-S-H-A-W. All right, thank you. And Ms. Bradshaw, you may begin your testimony whenever you're ready. Um, okay, um, I know all these acts make me sound like such a horrible person, but I don't think I'm that horrible. Um, uh, I know... Um, at the time of all of these acts, I guess we're just talking about my, um, the, the revoking of the prob probation, right? From, from my, uh, suspend, uh, revoking of my license, I mean, forward, right? Or am I going from the beginning, from my probation? I'm just... So what the board is interested in is, um, showing, is your, assessing your rehabilitation. So it depends on what type of rehabilitation you want to show. 
Um, so to understand your rehabilitation, there is um, some need to understand what happened so we okay. know what you need to be re rehabilitated from. Okay, well, actually, this whole thing really kind of stems from um, my personal matters of, you know, I've, I've actually printed, you've, you've probably read everything that I've already submitted, but basically, I had a lot of stress. I was taking care of my dad. He was very ill. I pretty much didn't pay attention to my business and uh, didn't pay attention and, you know, things happened. Most of the allegations, you know, a big portion of it is um, definitely has to do with improper note taking and, um, you know, insurance fraud, improper note taking and improper unethical billing. So I think that's the most, you know, heaviest weight, weight on my case. And so, as far as rehabilitation, um, you know, I've gone through a lot of rehabilitation. It's extensive. But, you know, through all of this, I realized I really didn't have a good grasp on note-taking or proper billing from the beginning after I've gone through all of this rehabilitation because I've actually done a lot of research. It's pretty much like I went back to school to learn how to do everything all over again. So um, my rehabilitation is pretty extensive. Um, I'm just going to refer to my notes just because my mind is like, ah, so I need to have a structure. <laughs> so I'm just going to kind of go through what I have. Um, yeah, so my rehab really, um, you know, I know there's a lot of issues with the billing. That's the main thing for me, it's that I, under I now understand the billing and proper note-taking because I've actually, you know, gone through and consulted with insurance companies at the time from the time of my accusation to find out, you know, what is proper billing, you know, what constitutes unethical billing and ethical billing, and different insurance companies have different, uh, you know, standards, so... I've gone through, you know, researched all of that. Even though I'm not a biller, I have a biller that would do the billing for me. But now I understand more of what, what's supposed to be done. So, um, let's see. I'm just going to go through all this. So, I, I did watch all the videos on the board's website. I have daily intro introspection. I do yoga, meditation. Um, listening to, I always go for my walks and listen to motivational speakers for my spiritual growth and things like that. Um, I did see Julie Armstrong, a psychotherapist, just to make sure everything was okay with me, that uh, there's nothing subconsciously going on that would ruin my efforts to assure myself and others that I'm genuine in my thoughts and my efforts. Um, what else? More self-help, yoga. I build myself up daily, working on my mind and body, blah, blah, blah. I was a member of the CCA. Um, now I'm knowledgeable about what constitutes excessive treatment because it was I was accused of excessive treatment, so now I know. Um, I promote public confidence in the chiropractic profession, profession by helping other chiropractors and my family members who are also doctors to uh, promote chiropractic at, at outdoor events and spinal screening events and um, different employee health fairs and things like that. Um, many of them, all kinds of 10K races and 5K races. I mean, that's always been ongoing, still is. So I just volunteer myself. Um, I have other chiropractic colleagues that I spend time with. And um, they support me. They're successful, successful people. So I'm happy to know them because they've been supportive, very supportive of me. Um, but as far as my rehab, the actual rehab of my, you know, what have I learned from all of this? Well, I've actually learned a lot. I've learned about, you know, I went through every accusation for every detail in the uh, accusation about, you know, what codes were, were wrong, you know, there was no medical necessity for this or that, or, you know, improper, you know, what these codes actually mean. There was misunderstandings with, you know, billing codes that were used. Like, you know, actually before I did not even really understand proper billing or note-taking. Now I do because I've researched all of it. 
I've, um, so a lot of this is in my, um, the literature that I've just gone online. I've spent a lot of time just researching, you know, guidelines, you know, I, I the guidelines and model disciplinary in order, orders, that's number one. Um, let's see, as far as the things that I've learned, you know, the billing codes like for 97110, 97530, you know, all of these, all of this billing codes I've just gone through to understand more, you know, of, of, you know, what the real way to do it is and not over billing, not, you know, bundling codes and things that were being done, um, using medical necessity forms, which I never did before for functional um, rehabilitation to actually find out, you know, where the person is at from the beginning and to see progress and actually using a structured form. So I know that. Um, so I've actually studied the proper procedures for the legal and ethical billing. Um, I've actually took, um, you know, I went to the Chiropractic Business Academy, which was the Porteous group before. So I've learned how to run and market the cash practice. So I've gone that route to learn all of that. Um, Let's see. So I've actually spent a lot of time with this, you know, figuring out how to do the billing properly, even though I'm not the biller, but that was the main thing of what was wrong. Um, let's see, functional performance. So let me see what else. Um, so anyhow, the main thing was, um, you know, prior to this, my dad was very ill. I took care of him, so I really wasn't really paying any attention because I was spending all my time taking care of him. And so he's passed. Um, so I have more, you know, I'm ready to participate in this profession 100%. I've gone over and above to actually spend a lot of time to see what, what, what went wrong how to take proper notes, which was very much lacking before. And if it hadn't have been, you know, if this hadn't have occurred, I would not have known now how to take, you know, much better notes and documentation. And I've taken several ethics courses, even extra more than I was supposed to, read a couple of books. Um, I feel that um, I've had extensive research on, on, all aspects of um, treatment, fraudulent billing, what constitutes fraud. Um, it's all here. Um, you know, misuse, coding misuse, prompting fraud investigations. Now I know, that's very, very bad. Um, just all of this stuff I really just did not have a grasp on before. So I'm much more aware of all of this. Um, of what constituted all of these things that I did. Um, if you have any questions, if anyone has any questions to help me, you know, guide me along as far as I would appreciate it, as far as if you would like to know anything else, um, I would appreciate it. <laughs> okay, Ms. Denver, cross-examination. Thank you. Um, I see that you had a psychological evaluation done in May of 2019. Yes. Um, did you pay to have that done? I did. And the purpose of that was to uh, to, to determine whether or not you're safe to practice, correct? Um, one of the reasons, yeah. Okay. What were the other reasons? Um, just to make sure that there wasn't something subconscious that I didn't know that would lead me to maybe doing bad things or overlooking certain things that were had gone wrong. Okay. And it says that, that your father got into the serious car accident in 2004. Is that correct? That's correct. And so from 2004 until 2018, he was pretty severely ill during that time frame? Um, well, getting worse. He was, he was, it was bad from the start. He rehabbed. And yes, um, yes, he was in an, a car accident. I don't know if I need to go through all of this, but hit by a drunk driver, I was his caretaker, one of them, I spent a lot of time with him, and um, he, his condition progressed, you know, it got worse, after he had like three strokes, 
and I had to move him about five times and take care of him. So things got worse and worse. So it was very distracting for me. And um, he's passed since. But that was a lot of stress for me. So I really was not functioning 100% to be in an office all day long. And I wasn't practicing, really, 100%. And uh, apart from the things you've done to uh, improve your skills, which we'll get to, is there anything that you can tell the board that would reassure them that if you find yourself in a very stressful personal situation in the future, that you will be able to practice safely despite that stress? Um, well, I'm pretty resilient normally. I mean, I'm very resilient. But, you know, I guess, you know, most people, if they are close with their family, and they, the, especially their, I was very close with my dad, so it was just sort of an instinctive thing just to drop everything and take care of him, number one. So that's the only thing that I could think of that would be, uh, you know, any sort of crisis, you know. I don't, can't think of anything equivalent to that, that in my life that could happen again, but I'm pretty, um, very much resilient as a person. Okay, and I saw um, that Dr. Armstrong noted that um, you have a strong support system at this time and engage in good self-care and are trying to do things to maintain a lower stress level. Is that true? I do. Um, could you explain what it is that you've learned about excessive treatment that you know now that is different than what you knew at the time? Um, excessive treatment, yeah. Um, well, there's certain guidelines as far as, you know, not over-treating by re-evaluating after, say, four weeks of care. So um, from what I've read so far and what I've learned, so standard treatment is like th about three three times a week for two to four weeks and then reevaluate. evaluate um, So as long as there's not a pr progressive worsening of their condition, um, so yeah, there will be a definite end to their treatment, you know, start and a definite end to their treatment, okay. unless there's some other issue that arises. And yes. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> okay. And you testified that you have also um, improved your documentation and you're now using forms you weren't using before? Actually, I've not been practicing at all. Okay, I'm sorry, but so, you've been but trained when I to do, use this. Yes, yes. So, I, um, yes, for functional reevaluation, for um, medical necessity, I've discovered forms that make would make everything much more legitimate and legal and proper as opposed to what I was doing before. Um, if the board were to grant your petition, are you willing to comply with terms of probation that could include monitored practice? Yes. And auditing of billing practices? Yes. And um, I see that you do owe a significant amount of money that's due prior to reinstatement. Um, if the board were to reinstate your license, um, would you be able to pay that or to enter into a payment plan to pay that amount down? Yes. And then, other than what you've already said, is there, is there anything that you can, uh, any assurances you can give the board to um, let them know that they can feel that you would be safe to practice uh, if you were to receive a probationary license from them at this time. What's different and why should they feel okay about that? Um, the, the main thing for me, what's different is I feel like I went through all of this that I went back to school, which you know now I know as far as for documentation and billing, which I really didn't, was not, um, you know, maybe I didn't really learn that stuff in school as well as I do now, but that's definitely, you know, a major thing, just knowing um, how to take proper documentation, how to um, evaluate medical necessity, how to ensure proper billing with the proper codes, not excessive, having excessive treatment. I've taken several ethics courses. I've read some books. Um, I know the... Um, you know, I know what can happen from fraudulent billing, and I definitely don't want to go down that road because I'm a good person, and um, I know you're, you can't, you know, it's just my word. Hopefully you'll take it. But um, I can only say, you know, my dedication to this profession is high. I, I'm very much, uh, you know, 
I help, uh, you know, I volunteer, you know, I go out and help the public understand about chiropractic. I uh, associate with successful doctors. I, um, I'm always reading about health issues and chiropractic and promoting it. Um, I'm a very good chiropractor. I'm not just a bone cracker. I do a lot of other things. I'm very cautious with people. I care about people. I spend the time. I don't do a quick, you know, you know, I actually spend a lot of time with people. Um, what else can I say? I mean, I, I'm, I'm a better person now. I'm a better chiropractor now. I can say just because of what I've learned throughout all of this than I was prior to all of this. I have no further questions. Okay, any questions by the board starting with uh, Dr. Paris? Hi, uh, I have one question. Um, am, am I correct? You have you have not practiced uh, since 2015. Yeah, I've been out of the office. So you have not you have not seen patients in, since 2015. I've not been there. No. So uh, my question is, can you can you tell me a little bit more about how you've um, how you've maintained your skills in history, physical exam, medical decision making, et cetera, um, over um, the last four years? Yeah, actually, I've decided to stay away from the office because just not to get in any trouble or be, you know, I've had just weird things happen where you know I just wanted to stay away and. Um, my skills, um, you know, I've practiced for a long time before, so my skills I know like the back of my hand. Um, I've taken other um, courses as far as, you know, like, excuse me, Dr. Porteous courses, and I've taken other courses like the TBM and, you know, muscle testing kind of seminars, and um, what else have I done? So diagnostic AK stuff, I, you know, I read a lot about that. You know, I, I have a lot of literature from all of my past seminars. And um, as far as being in practice and using all that stuff, I have not. But I'm confident that I haven't lost my memory to do all that stuff. And, and how about um, manual therapy skills, manipulation, any yeah, adjusting courses, like, anything? In, um, since just what, yeah. Yeah, I've taken like myofascial release courses. I've taken, you know, like in the Dr. Porteous, like with Dr. LeBeau, um, <clears throat> you know, practical okay. in the in the seminars. Thank you. And I am a good adjuster. I'm confident. And that's something that I think, you know, something that I'm never going to lose. It's like riding a bike. I have a whole analysis that I do. I just don't go cracking. Good afternoon. Um, what type of practice do you plan on having should you return? Um, the, you mean like as far as techniques? Techniques, uh, patients, how do you plan on acquiring patients? Um, yeah. I plan on going to work full time, uh, acquiring patients. I can easily make phone calls and get my all my patient list and market. I will be marketing to my past patients. Um, marketing on the internet and the type of practice you know I use a lot of techniques like you know not I use a lot of like uh, standard process you know, <coughs> applied kinesiology nutrition and muscle testing so I get a lot of my patients from that in the past and they've referred their family and friends just based on that muscle testing for some reason because it works so um, like I said, I'll be practicing full time. I'll be marketing myself. You know, I'm, I'm not afraid to just go hustling and door knocking. And I need to work, so I have fire under my feet to do so. And do you plan on opening up your own office or going in associateship with somebody else? I will have my own office. Um, and you previously testified that you did not learn the billing procedures in school? Not like I've learned them now. Do you feel that you 
have learned diagnos diagnosis and uh, you know all aspects of practicing besides that because you said you're relying on your memory that you have a good memory and you re you know um, your skills like the back of your hand yeah 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 no there's forms that I've had from the past you know just to lead me like for diagnosis um, yeah I know diagnosis I have reference manuals if I need to <clears throat> um, I educate people, you know, I'll go to the internet with them and show them what's going on and we'll talk about it in the past. That's what I've done. Um, and is there a reason why you're planning on going into practice by yourself versus possibly having some mentorship or an associateship with somebody else? Yeah, I've always had my practice since I had my license. The day after I got my license, I opened my office. So I've always been independent. I'm confident. I don't think I'd want to be on, you know, with anyone else. Maybe my sister. She's the acupuncturist, so we worked together before. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> um, what te techniques did you previously practice utilizing? Um, AK, SOT, network. Some diversified activator, um, Cox, the drop Thompson drop technique, um, and so there's a bunch of them. Sorry, it's okay. A lot of muscle testing type of techniques, like offshoots of AK, and also physical, uh, low force to high force, depending upon the situation. And to date, you haven't taken. Any seminars and all those the variety of techniques? I only see Gonstead and a couple of others. Yeah, TBM, uh, just whatever's uh, whatever they've taught in the um, relicensing seminars. <clears throat> so you're, but you're confident in your skills and abilities to be able to safely I continue am. adjusting. I am. And you currently are not practicing. Do you no longer have any? Um, ownership or relationship with the previous practices that you own? That's correct. And so you mentioned that you could just make a phone call and get those lists of patients. Are those not the, are those practice, have those practices been sold to someone and is that their, um, are those their patients now? I've just kept my patient lists like since 2011. I've just kept all of them so I don't have a problem calling everyone up. And currently you do have a balance and you say, stated that you would repay it. Are you currently on a payment plan? There was a $20,000 uh, balance from the probation period. I paid all that. And then there's another whopping 20000 left, right? It's 20000 ish left. Um, so I paid the first 20000 so that was a big chunk. Since I've not really been working, you know, I for I did not pay, so I would be okay with, of course, paying that um, and a few patient uh, payments just to chunk it out over, you know, a short period of time. But my question was, you're not currently paying anything not at this towards time. that. No, it's I believe it's twenty two thousand five hundred forty one dollars. Um, I have nothing further. Thank you. No questions. Thank you. I have no questions. <clears throat> I have no questions either. Great. Uh, Ms. Bradshaw, is there anything further you wanted to provide by um, way of redirect? Um, I do. Sorry, I have to refer to my notes. Because my, you know. I'm on the spot, so I have to find it. Um, my regret, well, I regret this happened. I regret that I didn't take precautions to have better oversight with my office and with the billing and everything else. So I regret this has happened. This has really put a big, you know, it's just a big setback in my life. So I do regret that. On the other hand, <clears throat> In a weird way, I'm kind of thankful in a way that this has happened 
in a weird way, just because now I know what I didn't know before as far as billing procedures and doing things the right way and the details of what can happen from fraudulent billing and just going down that road, which I definitely will definitely avoid at all costs. Um, uh, let's see. So, um, what else? I have taken full responsibility for all of my actions. Um, it's been a while since, you know, it, this shouldn't have happened. So I, I have taken responsibility. I feel that justice has been served. I feel that I've taken enough time to um, educate myself, to, um, you know, I've really spent a lot of time. I've had a lot of time on my hands to do, to, to learn all this stuff. But, um, yeah, I regret this has happened. And I do apologize to the board and to the public. I know this is, you know, cost the taxpayers money. It's not good for the profession. It's, you know, I would like to be a better role model for the profession. And I regret being here today. And I do thank you for listening to me. Anything further on recross, uh, Ms. Denver? No. Okay, and lastly, any further questions by the board? All right, uh, hearing none. Um, Ms. Bradshaw, do you have any further evidence you would like to uh, provide? Um, not anything other than what you guys have. Okay, thank you. So closing arguments, Ms. Denver, do you wish to provide one? No, thank you. All right, Ms. Bradshaw, your closing argument. Uh, my closing argument, do I have to argue? Um, my closing argument. Am I supposed to argue? I mean, what does that mean, my closing argument? Um, so any uh, any argument you want to make as to why your petition should be granted. So now that you've provided your evidence, so it's really um, um, arguing your evidence. If there's anything else you want to say. Okay, I do. Um, well, I'm a responsible person that I know. I'm, at least I paid half of that huge chunk of the fines. You know, I've, I've already paid $21,000. That's huge. Um, my calling is to be a chiropractor, a healer. I've always wanted to be a doctor since I was seven. So <clears throat> it, it went from cardiology to chiropractic. So this has been the thing that I really, it's really part of me. And it's really, um, I'm just looking forward to hopefully getting, getting this all behind me. Um, let's see. Uh, 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 uh. Let's see, what else? Um, I've renewed my knowledge of ethics and correct procedures that's made me confident to properly re-enter this profession. I have 100% um, confidence in myself and um, prepared and prepared to go forward and to do this on the right foot going forward. Um, I'm rehabilitated. I have a new, renewed perspective with high ethical standards necessary to proceed correctly in this profession. Um, I've complied with the laws, regulations, and procedures for reinstating my license since revocation. I've gone above and beyond to show the board that I'm rehabilitated and prepared to enter back in the profession. I'm committed to doing everything possible to do so. Um, I do recognize my mistakes. I've taken action to understand what went wrong so it won't happen again by uh, learning about the ethics, ethical billing, proper note taking, as I've told you before, I really didn't understand so well about, you know, I thought I was doing it well, but apparently not as well as, you know, as I know now. Um, and that's it. I think, thank you, all of you. Okay, thank you. So the record's closed, the matter's submitted, and we're off the record. Uh, so again, Ms. Bradshaw, if uh, after you gather your belongings, if you would have a seat in the audience and just wait for the court reporter to finish uh, his form, and then when you see that he's done, if you, you could uh, grab your copy on the way out. And that's just in case you want a copy of today's record. Okay. All right, and I wish you good luck. Thank, thank you. you. And so we'll take a short recess while the court reporter finishes up on this matter and gets prepared for the next uh, 
matter, which will be uh, Lance Mahoney. Okay, good afternoon. We're back on the record after closed session of uh, deliberation of our petitioner hearings. And we are now going to take a one-hour lunch and resume promptly at 2.25. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. We're back on the meeting. Back on the record here at 2.28, um, we finished the uh, deliberation of the petitioner hearings in closed session. We're back on the agenda items number seven. Um, we will be completing all of those and having yet another closed session at the end of the, at the, end of the afternoon here or evening. Um, at this moment, I just want to take a moment as a chair to uh, reflect on some of the and highlight some of the accomplishments since our last meeting. Many of the board's achievements may not be apparent to the casual observer, but as I've said in previous reports, the real work happens in the days and the months between the board meetings. Um, sadly, as many of you know, government work is rarely sensational, not the type of stuff that goes viral on social media. Um, nonetheless, uh, we're excited, and the work is important, often complicated, but most importantly, it's, it's very necessary for us to do the things that we've done. The fact that we go unnoticed by licensees in the public is actually a good thing. Rest assured, if the work wasn't being done, both constituencies would notice, and we'd be getting media and social media attention. With that in mind, I'm pleased to highlight the significant efforts we've invested in, in development developing a 21st century information technology system that I believe all boards uh, will notice in a good way. The work began well over a year ago with the detailed mapping of the necessary steps for virtually all of the board's licensing, continuing education, and enforcement processes, and identifying opportunities to automate each process. That was just the beginning. It's underway. We now are able to collect licensing fees, and um, we hope to have everything completed in short order. Do we have a time frame on that, Marcus? Um, not, not, not particularly at this time. However, um, we will get an IT update in a few minutes. Okay. Thank you. With invaluable guidance, tremendous support from uh, the Department of Consumer Affairs and our board staff, Assistant EO, Marcus MacArthur here in particular, and uh, Robert Polio has coordinated with key staff at the California Technology Agency, the Department of Finance, and the state legislature to justify the significant investment in new technology. The state's project approval process is daunting, and with good reason. The governor and the legislature want to ensure taxpayers' dollars, and in the board's case, licensees' dollars, aren't wasted on technology that ultimately fails to meet the board's regulatory needs. The project approval by bar is set high. Our team didn't shy away from this monumental challenge. In fact, the board of chiropractic examiners embraced the opportunity to be among the first group of regulatory boards to move through the project approval process, meeting every requirement and deadline along the way. The rollout should begin in the coming months, and uh, as you heard Marcus state, we'll be getting a more accurate assessment from our uh, technology officers for the Department of Consumer Affairs. In a few minutes here, the board will be voting on a new chair. I'll be passing on that baton. Um, unfortunately, today is uh, likely Dr. Corey Lickman's last day. He's uh, completed his term and served completing out his grace period. And on February 10th, Dr. Dane and I um, will be completing our second term and final terms on the board, and um, we will hopefully be able to serve out our, our one-year grace period following the expiration date. Um, during that time, we certainly both uh, desire to continue to lead and help out and mentor and uh, share any of the lessons we've learned over our past eight years on the board. Um, there is a chance Governor Newsom may appoint somebody in either of our positions, so this may be our last opportunity. Um, 
I'm extremely proud of the work that we've done in the last eight years, and certainly none of that would have been able to happen without the, the work of all of our staff. So um, quite often, board members are given directives. Um, Mr. Puglio has been spectacular in leading our staff, Marcus, um, Valerie, Dixie, Kristen, Andrea, everybody here has been uh, extremely helpful and there's many more back at the board office that have all worked very diligently in helping to um, really bring things to a different light. Over the past eight years, we've had a great opportunity to rewrite many of our legislative or regulatory guidelines, um, our, our rules and regulations, our administrative manual. We're currently still working hard at uh, continuing education and whatnot. So um, I trust that as we move on, Dr. Paris, Dr. McLean, Mr. Rufino, and whoever else is appointed in our places um, will be able to continue leading the profession and the board forward in, uh, in serving the public well. So I want to thank everybody for their opportunity, for this opportunity. It's uh, humbling and uh, truly an honor. I want to absolutely thank our staff, and I want to give uh, Dr. Dane and uh, Dr. Lickman an opportunity to say something also. I'm torn, I hope to, and hope to not continue in a year grace period because we uh, really would urge the governor's office to make some appointees to our board. Um, it is important for our profession. It's important for the public all the way around for us to have a strong and coherent board together. It's been my honor and pleasure to serve the public as well as the governor's office and serve with my fellow board members. So thank you very much. As uh, one of the youngest here on the board, uh, I've learned a lot, and uh, it has, as well, uh, been an honor to serve the public, governor's office, um, everyone on the board, the staff, thank you very much uh, for helping me personally guide through this, uh, Sergio, Heather, Dion, and the past board members and future board members. Uh, I know we'll just continue to improve on things that have been going on in my terms that I've been here uh, and I'm excited to see what will go uh, keep going on and moving forward for uh, the public and, and for our board uh, so thank you and I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, take a moment to reflect on members that we've served with um, uh, Dr. Franco Colombo the late Dr. Franco Colombo uh, Dr. Julie Elginer one of our Previous public members was a wealth of knowledge and was spectacular. Um, that doesn't take anything away from Mr. Rufino, who uh, we're very, very proud and glad to have, but um, she was excellent and is not here um, to celebrate in this. So um, thank you, everybody, once again. So we're going to move on to the approval of the October 24th, 2019 board minutes. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. I have some. Um, oh, second. Corrections. So I have some corrections first. Um, if we move to page seven, start there. Um, about halfway through, where the. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Paragraph there that begins with Mr. Puglio responded that the board automate the process with its existing IT system. I think that should have read cannot with its existing, if I'm correct in the interpretation. Sorry, page seven, you said? Page seven, midway through. Um, where it begins with your name. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it cannot or is unable to um, would be appropriate. So, it should say. okay, so, so just exactly. to correct that, that it's cannot or there, then. 
um, on page nine. Um, the third paragraph from the bottom, Dr. Paris responded unaware. I think it should read he is that he is unaware. Just a grammatical correction there. And then on page 10 at the at the top, um, it reads Mr. Paris. I think that should say Dr. Paris. He's earned that, right? Thank you. <laughs> You're well, welcome. We revoked him for a few Ooh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and it didn't work out for you. And then on page 12, um, the adjournment. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Did that come from Dr. Azzolino? It was? He did give a speech. Okay. I'm sorry, Frank. <laughs> That's it for me. Public comment. Let's call for the vote. Dr. Azulino? Yes. Dr. McLean? Yes. Frank Rafino? Yes. Dr. Dan? Yes. Dr. Lichtman? Yes. Dr. Paris? Yes. Motion carries. Dr. Azulino, can we take the agenda items out of order? Please. Can we um, now move to agenda item 16? Budget? Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. My name is Taylor Schick. I'm the fiscal officer for the Department of Consumer Affairs. I've been requested to uh, come here today to go over the board's fund condition. Um, I apologize for the lateness of providing that. It should have been handed out to you just uh, a couple minutes ago. It's a document that looks like this, and I'll go over it shortly. I'm going to uh, read it left to right, uh, or left to right, uh, top to bottom. And you'll see it displays right now five fiscal years, starting with prior year 2018-19, all the way through um, fiscal year 2022-23. So every fund condition we're looking at it, uh, the impact to your fund on a fiscal year basis, running from July 1st of the year to June 30th of each year. Right now, uh, we are having some difficulties with the fiscal system, but prior year 2018-19 is based on year-end actuals right now. The true financial statements have yet to be completed, but we do anticipate them being completed within the next couple months. But this is the best reflection of the board's actual expenditures and revenues through 2018-19. We also have an adjusted beginning balance. You'll see that um, in the second line at the top there. Uh, 732,000, and that reflects a prior year adjustment for 1718. So, when we look at a fund condition, what we're looking at is the beginning balance that we have on record with the state controller's office. We're looking at any prior year adjustments that were made in the existing year against the prior year, and then we take a look at any revenues or transfers made into the fund. So, these are the revenues that you're bringing in primarily with your licensee fees and any interest earned with money that's. Um, in the state uh, surplus fund. And then we go, if you follow that down, you'll see that you have a total resources. So that's how much money we have dedicated in the fund. And then we take a look at your expenditures for that year. And your expenditures not only include the board's direct appropriation, its obligations to expend money for salaries, uh, benefits, as well as operating expenses to support those staff. So that's rent, uh, any contracts that you have, um, costs with the Attorney General's office to prosecute cases, etc. We also have costs related to statewide prorata, as well as a supplemental pension payment cost there. And the supplemental pension payment was a cost that was uh, created through uh, a bill in 2017, Senate Bill 84, which authorized a $6 billion payment to CalPERS to fund pension payments. 
Um, and that is a, um, it's essentially a loan and it's going to be paid back from all the general funds and special funds that have positions, that have pensions that are obligated to them. So we do anticipate that those payments are going to run through 2024, 20, 25. And you'll see under that row, you have a, uh, a cost of 41,000 in the prior year of 1819. And we're anticipating costs of 85,000 annually uh, through 24, uh, 20, 24, 25. Following through on 2018-19, at the bottom we do have a fund balance for the board of about $1.9 million, which equates to essentially what we call um, months in reserve, about four and a half months in reserve. And what that means is that if all revenue ceased for the board, you would be able to continue operating for about four and a half months without any other uh, influx of revenue. Typically. When we're looking at a program, we'd like to see them anywhere from probably six to 12 months in reserve, just to make sure they have a healthy fund. And we start to take a look at the program's fund condition really closely if we start to see it dropping below three months in reserve. Um, obviously, with um, our various boards and bureaus, some of the fees are structured either in regulation or through statute. It does take time to get fee increases into effect to account for what we would call structural imbalance in the fund, and that's where expenditures exceed revenues. So looking at that bottom line of the Munson Reserve, we will see that the fund is projected to decline um, fairly significantly over the next several years, going from four and a half months in reserve all the way down to 0.2 months in reserve by 2022-23. Uh, there's a lot of factors that go into this. Uh, keep in mind that the board does typically have reversion, so it does not spend its full appropriation. But we are seeing um, several annual cost um, factors that have been coming in in recent years. So over the sev last several years, we've had various bargaining unit contracts that have increased the amount that we need to compensate our um, staff. So we've seen a lot of general salary increases over the last several years. There was just um, a recent... Um, approval of various bargaining unit contracts, and we're anticipating an increase in salaries going forward, um, anywhere from about 25 to 2% over the next several years. So that's going to be a, a fairly significant cost factor. We're also looking at um, attorney general cost increase, where they just raised their fees this year going forward. And while we don't think that the board will need an appropriation increase to cover those costs, it will eat into those monies that the board has typically reverted every year. So where the board has been able to revert um, several hundred thousands every year, we're estimating that's not going to occur going forward. So the thing to see right now is that right now, this fund condition, as it shows right now, shows the board declining and being only at 0.2 months in reserves by 2223. Um, I do want to acknowledge that there are potential cost increases that have not been factored in yet. Um, will most likely be able to be released on January 10th with the release of the governor's budget. That could change this picture dramatically because we do know there are several cost impacts, as I had mentioned, the AG rate increase, as well as the employee compensation rate increases, retirement rate increases. So year after year, those costs directly impact the board, as well as they directly impact all of the other um, divisions that the board helps support. So anytime there's a general salary increase, that's increasing salaries across the state, um, as well as for the department. So it will increase departmental prorata, statewide prorata, et cetera. So those are cost impacts that are really outside of your control that are going to be borne every single year. So um, I will have a better fund condition or a more accurate fund condition for you next month that will display a lot of the adjustments that have already been made for the governor's budget going forward in 2021. Um, so that's going to change this picture slightly. But the one thing I do want to note is that with that fund decline, um, it is important to note that the fund is running a structural imbalance right now. And one of, the, you know, I've gone over some of those cost impacts, but that's something that would need to be looked at and potentially addressed in the future with a potential fee increase. And I'll be working with the board to look at potential options and how severe um, the need would be um, after the Jan 10 governor's budget is released. That's about it for my presentation. I do open it up for any questions that you may have on this document and or any questions you might have about the budget or the budget process in general. 
Thank you. Any chance that uh, the changes that the governor proposes in his budget may be favorable for our, our situation? Uh, typically not, as we're seeing. <laughs> and really, what I what I'm going over is is cost. Just the cost to run state government have been sure. increasing year over year. An another factor in here, and you will see it uh, if you look at the expenditures line under that. Um, the first line under disbursements under expenditures. You'll see it says 1111, Department of Consumer Affairs, Regulatory Boards. That's the board's appropriation. You will see it spikes in 1920 and then goes down substantially in 2021. And that is uh, directly related to your business modernization plan that we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, we do anticipate that those costs, there will be substantial savings in 1920 related to that project, but we do anticipate that the costs are essentially going to be deferred into 2021. So, you know, part of... Um, a reason for the funds decline is also related to the business modernization project because updating your IT platform is not going to be cheap and it is a cost of business and it is something that does need to be updated for the board. So I do want to highlight that as well. So you will see a proposal potentially coming up in the governor's budget to reflect that change in costs as well as most likely adjustments for the employee compensation, uh, retirement, statewide parada, and other um, adjustments as well. We just recently instituted a fee increase, as you may or be aware of. Yes. And so are there any other areas that you can help us out with um, to get this back in balance? We'll help the board explore all those options. Primarily what we're going to be looking at is trying to predict as well as we can what the cost impacts are going to be on the fund and on the board going into the future. Oftentimes it's hard to predict what costs may increase. Um, you know, we, we weren't aware that the AG was looking at potentially increasing rates, so that's a fairly significant cost factor that we're now looking into to try to figure out how is that rate increase going to impact the board's expenditures going forward. So we'll work with them to try to look at, you know, what options we have to potentially mitigate costs down the road. Uh, my concern is that the board's already doing a lot to, you know, run as lean as possible. And with all these cost increases that are just, you know, on the natural for running state government, it's possible it's most likely not going to be possible for the board to continue to cut costs to try to mitigate the need for a future fee increase. And so what I would uh, recommend when we work with the board is to look at all options and look really what the board does need to support its operations going uh, forward into the future. Yeah, thank you. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding sure. this, and I think you already answered this question. I just, you were talking fast and I might have missed it. The pro rata, you, it's going down, and you said in 2020, 2021, and you think that's because of the um, the technology changes and some savings. Is so, that what you said? So the pro rata is a little bit different. Uh, okay. the, the board's direct appropriation, if we're looking at that line, you'll see it goes from uh, 3,666,000. That's what the board's actual expenditures were in 1819. Okay. Well, the full appropriation for 1920 is 4.9 million. Right. That 4.9 million includes the IT project. Got it. Is, it. Uh, approved on a one year limited term basis. Yes. And we are anticipating there will be savings out of that appropriation. Okay. But we anticipate those costs are more going to be spread out into the following year. So while there will be savings in 1920, the costs will be deferred into 2021. Okay, that was one question you answered. Uh, pro rata, you are estimating that it's going to go down, which so, has not been our experience in the past. So pro rata does fluctuate every year, um, especially statewide pro rata. It's operated on what they call a two-year roll forward basis. So oftentimes they're assessing their costs based on the size of the department's overall budget. And every year they take an assessment, they go, look, how much do we charge them? How much should we have charged them? And whatever that difference is, they'll roll forward the next time the budget's released. So we do oftentimes, even though we know state government is increasing, we'll, we will see if they had anticipated to increase greater than it actually did. We'll see a calculation to adjust it down, but in my sense, while it will go down overall over the next several years, that you know, with employee compensation increases and just state government increasing, we do anticipate the cost for statewide parada will continue to rise. Okay, and then after January tenth, when the information comes out, mm -hmm. are we going to get an update of yes. this? 
Um, so a, a new okay. fund condition will be displayed in the governor's budget display, which will be released on the Department of Finance's website. Uh, it only displays three years, so it will have uh, prior year 1819, current year 1920, and budget year 2021, but we'll also prepare a fund condition for the board that goes out uh, beyond that with our estimates for the out years. Okay, thank you. And I will note that in those out years, we do build in a cost increase factor into the appropriation of approximately 3%, and that's to try to capture uh, those cost increases related to the things I had mentioned and, you know, depending on what actual um, adjustments occur each year, that 3% modifier um, oftentimes is not overly accurate, but it's our best estimate right now based on the historical adjustments that we've seen for our various boards and bureaus of how the budget increases outside of direct uh, budget change proposals that would be pursued by the board. One last question. Um, where are we at in comparison to other regulatory boards that you are overseeing? So right now, um, to be honest, we're seeing several uh, large programs that are in the process of seeking uh, fee increases. Oftentimes they do a fee study in advance of pursuing that fee increase so they can have an outside vendor come in, take a look at what their operations are, take a look at all their fee categories and determine what the correct level is to set those fees at. And they typically have that report to back up any uh, statutory fee change they want to undertake or possible regulatory fee change that they want to take. Uh, so you're not alone. Um, a lot of programs we have seen in the last several years have needed to seek fee increases um, with the various um, cost cutting that occurred uh, throughout the, you know, from 2000 to 2010 along with the recession. We didn't see a lot of increase in fees over those years. And then when we came out of that and costs started to increase in state government and a lot of things started to loosen up a little bit, we've seen the need for fee increases coming after that. And a lot of our programs haven't adjusted fees in close to 10 to 15 years. Um, typically, our boards aren't, you know, adjusting with inflation. It's as time goes on. We're studying the, the fund condition, determining, oh, hey, we've got some cost increases that we're seeing. We need to make sure that this fund stays solvent, and that's when we start to take a look and drive possibly a study to review the fee structure and ensure it's supportable for the costs that we're estimating against the board. Yeah. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Good afternoon. You guys can hear me? All right. Um, uh, board chair, uh, members of the board, just want to thank you for the opportunity to come and speak uh, and give you an update on our business modernization effort. Um, before I departed from across the parking lot at HQ1 over here, I heard the board chair um, acknowledging a lot of the efforts that have been made um, by members of your staff and your leadership towards a modernized IT solution to better improve the services that you provide to your uh, licensees as well as your consumers. Um, so uh, I had quite a long spiel thanking all the staff for all of their efforts. So um, uh, for the sake of not being redundant, I'll just say that um, the, uh, the efforts of the staff at the, bureau, uh, at the Board of Chiropractic Examiners as well as the leadership has been exemplary throughout the, uh, um, uh, the business modernization process. Um, to cite a few examples, um, uh, the Executive Officer Puglio has been there supporting us at our various uh, budget committee hearings, um, as well as informational hearings uh, at the legislature, supporting our path forward. Um, and Assistant Executive Officer uh, MacArthur has been uh, working with me on um, hundreds of pages of solicitation documents, getting me clarifications on functional requirements, um, all things that um, are, are uh, very time consuming, but very important to the success of an overall project. So I commend uh, the entire board and their staff on, on their support. Um, I'd like to give you an update as to where we are at in the process and then follow that up with kind of what the next 18 to 24 months will look like as far as our plan on implementing a modernized IT system. So we have been engaged um, over the last year with the California Department of Technology in um, planning for our business modernization uh, project. So um, the Board of Chiropractic Examiners is one of four programs that are on the leading edge 
of the modernization initiative, and we're nearly done with the fourth stage of the four-stage California Department of Technology project approval life cycle um, uh, process. So any state uh, entity who is pursuing a large IT initiative goes through this standard uh, process through the California Department of Technology where we plan for, uh, develop solicitation documents, um, and then uh, review uh, uh, bid or, bids related to the IT uh, components of the system uh, prior to formally signing off and starting the project. And we are in the telltale end of that process um, uh, as we speak right now and should be wrapping it up before the end of this month. Um, so we will be in uh, uh, going into implementation mode very, very shortly, which is extremely exciting for me as um, I'll be serving as the, the project director. Um, uh, and as I had on previous uh, state projects, and um, I kind of jumped right into it, but again, um, my name is Sean O'Connor, OIS, Chief of Project Delivery, in case I didn't say that part earlier, the record state that. Um, uh, but uh, I wanted to uh, just say we're, we're right at the tail end, and we're about to go into project mode. And um, a couple of the key tenants that we've planned for in ensuring this project is a success is to... Uh, leverage an incremental, more agile type of approach to implementing um, the project. So we want to, instead of investing 18 months um, uh, uh, and, and doing a huge system replacement at the end that is extremely risky with lots of uh, project risks around data conversion um, and organizational change management, what the department has been successful in doing in other recent projects is to take smaller bites at the apple as we move, ac move along uh, the project implementation phase and focus on key areas um, that are um, critical to improving the business services as well as um, uh, targeting specific areas so that we're not introducing too much change and too much risk uh, to the organization all at once. So to, to give you an example of that, we've worked with your leadership to identify the public facing components of um, online application submissions, back office um, evaluation, of those applications and improving communication with the applicant pool um, as they proceed through the application process as the early areas that we want to focus on in the project to um, get that implemented sometime in the summer of this year. Um, and then from there we will move on to other areas of improvement like enforcement um, uh, as, as the project commences. Um, the overall project period is 18 months um, and then we will have maintenance and operations after that. This will include a um, system integrator who will complement uh, state staff in implementing this system. And the long-term plan, um, as we have successfully done elsewhere on other recent projects, is to uh, empower the state staff, the state IT staff, to maintain the system moving forward so that we're not beholden to any larger contractor rates uh, going off into the future and to, um, uh, to be more uh, financially prudent um, uh, with the, uh, for the Board of Chiropractic Examiners. Um, a couple other things I wanted to, to just mention is that we will, um, the structure of the contract that we are using for um, our system integrator who will be coming on board is one that is comparable to the, what was used with the Bureau of Cannabis Control on their recent project implementation, which came in um, under budget. And that is that we set um, a not to exceed amount for the contract and we incrementally approve um, a chunks of uh, payments over time. So um, we have a total contract amount um, that is identified. And as we proceed through the, uh, through the contract and project period, um, we work with your leadership to approve and say, we're going to approve four to six, um, to six weeks worth of work at a time, which will have deliverables tied to it. And those deliverables have to come in as of sufficient quality in order for us to pay the contractor. So it gives the state a lot of control. Um, over the quality of work of the contractor and also builds in kind of natural checkpoints at which if particular staff are not working out or if a particular approach is not working out, we're not deep into a million dollar contract determining that we need to pivot. We're, um, you know, at a manageable amount of money into a, a contract determining that we need to, to pivot. So um, I've uh, personally worked on the Bureau of Cannabis Control implementation as well where we use this to a great degree of success and um, I really think it's a model um, for the uh, for the state organizations to use moving forward. Um, finally, um, our our goal here is to implement an IT solution um, that will meet the immediate needs of the uh, Board of Chiropractic Examiners, but also uh, have the ability to continue to grow moving forward um, and an ability to be 
um, uh, uh, integrated with other third-party systems if we determine um, that other functional needs are there. Um, and it's, it's very characteristic of the marketplace right now that um, more modernized IT systems have the ability to integrate in real time with third parties, with other applications. If there's particular applications that do continuing education really well or inspections really well, um, we're able to uh, integrate our system with theirs easily without having to um, take all that functionality and um, if our system doesn't do it well to kind of fit a square peg into a round hole. So um, it's a more open architected approach that will set us up uh, for success moving forward. And um, one thing that I wanted to draw uh, to the, uh, the board members' attention to is that uh, while we are pursuing a modernized IT system that is going to provide a great deal of functionality moving forward, we have worked with the leadership within, um, uh, within your board to implement an interim measure to allow for online renewals. Um, so uh, there is currently in place a uh, ability for folks to do online renewals. And um, I wanted to just kind of quote with that interim type of solution what kind of uptick we are seeing. We had um, our staff run some adoption rates, and it looks like in November we had about 12% of the renewals received came in through the online renewal, but in December that crept all the way up to 30, 32%. So um, we're seeing a, a um, large increase in the amount of folks who are uh, renewing online, which is good. Um, we'd like to see that number creep up over time, and with the expanded functionality and presence as we move forward, um, that, will, uh, uh, that will hopefully take place. So um, with that, I'd be happy to entertain any questions uh, that the members might have. I just wanted to, um, first of all, uh, point out that this month, I believe, is the first month that the um, notification is going in with the license renewals, So, because we wanted to make sure it was functioning properly before um, we started mass announcing it. So we anticipate that number will jump, not just creep up, hopefully. And, um, and finally, I want to thank Sean and Taylor and their staffs for the tremendous support they've provided us because we've we've been faced with a lot of major challenges uh, for a small board and um, we couldn't have done any of this without their assistance and they did the lion's share of the work we we've, we've done everything we can to um, assist but uh, it, I just can't tell you how much um, I appreciate it. and I appreciate you being here today because although I understand everything we're doing. I can't articulate it as well. And so you saved me a lot of trouble in my um, chair's report in explaining this um, in a technically correct way. Thank you. Sorry. Um, understanding um, some of the intricacies of what this will entail um, and the abilities that we will have. One of the things that we discussed previously with Marcus, um, and I just wanted to reiterate, that we will, this will um, en enable us to have the ability to extract information like, right now we don't gather the information on retirees and that sort of thing, but at some point when we gather that information, we'll be able to extract that and utilize that for the reports and things that we talked about, um, hoping to be able to to ascertain in the future? Um, yes, absolutely. So um, the uh, we have t two points I wanted to make on that, Dr. McLean, and that is that um, uh, we will be building, if the, if the board has an interest in collecting that sort of data, um, whether it be on retirees or, or anything, um, uh, collecting that data into this system um, will not be an issue. Um, and we are also um, going to be integrating this new system with an existing reporting business intelligence tool that the department has, has been utilizing with their current systems um, and which is available uh, uh, to, to uh, your board now for some of the legacy systems. So we are an interest in being able to store that data and get to that data easily is, uh, is, is one of the requirements of this particular project. And in regard to what you're specifically speaking about, um, I also talked to Sean earlier in the week and um, his staff is going to set up some Qbert training. So just like he said, with the reporting tool that DCA currently utilizes, um, they have specific staff that's trained. Kristen and I and Dixie will be um, getting that training. And so we'll be setting that up with the OIS office soon. It's a little bit more complicated than I initially anticipated. So I tried to kind of 
utilize it myself and it's just a little bit more sophisticated so we need to get training from the professionals before we can do it but we'll be able to get that data sooner than later That's great. thank you very much very exciting um and while we have taylor here how much is it going to be to maintain such a system on an annual basis Sure. So we, we've got, um, uh, we did an initial market research to derive some cost estimates um, uh, related to how much, how many state staff we would need, what the marketplace was like from a system integration perspective for the initial setup consulting types of fees that we would expect, as well as software costs moving forward. Um, I did mention we're at the tail end of stage four, so we're um, still in technically open procurement at this time. Um, so. I can't speak in detail with what the, the total amounts will be, but um, I believe that our initial cost estimates that we've done in the market research will hold up once we're able to um, release exactly what, um, uh, what the final contracts came in at. Um, I do not anticipate that it will be um, something where we have a spike in costs over and above what we, what we have planned for. Um, and I've uh, spoken with the budget office, and very, very soon we will be able to share the hard numbers. We're just kind of at that awkward state of nearing the end of the of the stage four before it becomes public information, um, uh, and then we can share much more detailed information with you at that point. Thank you. Um, I'm assuming we'll be able to reallocate some staff resources, um, certainly when it comes to uh, renewals, if this is in place. So this is very helpful. Thank you. It, uh, we we do um, anticipate efficiencies that will um, help us to reallocate resources so, and use those for other desirable projects instead of just you know having to do sure. the the core work. Anything else? Well, thank you. Thank You're going to you be a popular guy among us today. <laughs> Sorry, Taylor. He had good news for us. Okay, so we're going to get back on our agenda item number 10, ratification of approved license applications. Move to ratify. Any discussion? Public comment? Call for the vote. Dr. Rosalino? Yes. Dr. McLean? Yes. Rufino? Yes. Dr. Dan? Yes. Dr. Lickman? Yes. Dr. Paris? Yes. Motion carries. Item number 11 is ratification of denied license applications, which the applicants did not request a hearing, and there are none. Um, Item number 12 is ratification of approved continuing education providers. Move approval. Second. Discussion? Public comment? Call for the vote, please. Dr. Azulino? Yes. Dr. McLean? Yes. Rufino? Yes. Dr. Dan? Yes. Dr. Lickman? Yes. Dr. Paris? Yes. Motion carries. Excellent. And now we move on to the election of board officers. I'm sorry, I just want to make sure. I think you missed item 10, but maybe I was. Um, no, we did it. Okay, I, I got distracted. I just but I wanted to make sure. So, election of board officers. And I'll turn this over to uh, Mr. Knutes. Yes, thank you. And I believe from, oh, thank you. Changes to the slate. I'd like to propose one. 
Gotcha. So for, for those not currently nominated, are there any board members that have nominations or who would like to be considered? So then are we moving on to uh, the uh, statements of interest? I'd like to remove my name for nomination of vice chair. You good with that? So, noting that Dr. Azzolino has removed himself from consideration, he's uh, declined that nomination. So, at this point, we are stating statements of interest, and we can start with the chair and with Dr. David Paris. No, no, no. Cur currently nominated, okay. so nominated for the position of chair. So, with this step in the process, with this step in the process, should a candidate be interested in providing a statement to the board about their interests? You can, and if you choose not to, you can do that as well. Thank you. You may want to not say anything. Make a change of mind. I have no statement. <laughs> you have statement. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Vice Chair. Oh, Should we, we just do the vote and then go to the next um, we just do the vote. position? I'm, we can. I just, yeah. Why I don't think, we do that? Why don't we vote on chair and then um, okay. and then we'll ask the vice chair nominee. If they have a point. Okay, so point. Point of information. Since there's only one nominee, can we actually have to have a vote, or can we do by acclamation? Um, I think I think for minutes purposes, we should probably do an individual vote. Roll call vote. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, Mr. Rufino, can you please call the roll for the position of chair, which is uh, Dr. David Paris was nominated and is uncontested. Okay. For the position of chair, Dr. Azzolino. Yes. Dr. McLean. Yes. Your call vote should be opposite. Oh. I'm sorry. Yes. Go down sorry, the roll call. I got, sorry, I got the wrong, the wrong roll call vote sheet. Dar, okay, we'll start all over again. Dr. Dan. Yes. Dr. Lickman. Yes. Dr. McLean. Yes. Dr. Paris. Yes. Rafino, yes. Dr. Azzolino. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> I get to go sit on the side now. It's that fast. Away from the camera. Should we applaud? <laughs> All right, Mr. Rufino, can you please call the vote for the position of vice chair? Dr. Dion McLean is currently unopposed. I'm sorry. Did you want to make a statement? I'm sorry. Um, Would you like sure, to make a statement? I'll make a statement. No, just that it continues to be my honor to serve in any capacity with this board and to work with the individuals on this board and I look forward to continuing the work that we have done so far taking what the previous generation has generation <laughs> same age <laughs> no, we, has implemented or the previous um, members have implemented and continuing on with those efforts okay so we're voting for the vice chair Dr. Den Dr. Lickman. Yes. Dr. McLean. Yes. Dr. Paris. Yes. Rufino. Yes. Dr. Azzolino. Yes. Congratulations, Vice Chair.
Madam Vice Chair, you have been duly elected. Fino, would you like to make a statement for the position of secretary? Nope. <laughs> so would you please call for the vote for yourself as secretary? Dr. Dan? Yes. Dr. Lickman? Yes. Dr. McLean? Absolutely. Dr. Perez? Yes. Rafino abstain. Dr. Azzolino? Yes. I guess I'm to continue to be the chair. <laughs> I mean, the, oh, the chair. <laughs> I just made myself a chair. No, your most job. Oh, my <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> See, that's. <laughs> Would you like to switch seats? No. We should take a break. No. Let's take a short break. We need to take a, a break to celebrate here. Um, just a five-minute yeah, break. Just a few minutes so they can reorganize serve with a, a group of leaders and staff um, that I respect tremendously. And my hope is to not only continue the great work uh, this board has done and continues to do, but also to serve the board with a progressive, mindful leadership that meets with the approval and satisfaction of the staff, the board, the state, and to the benefit of Californians everywhere. So thank you very much. Thank you. And next on the agenda, uh, Executive Officer's Report. Hand it um, over to Robert Pulio. Um, Mr. Chair, I think we are scheduled for a quick uh, comfort break. Okay, we're going to take a 15 minute break. And then well, we're not, we're it doesn't have to be 15, but just a quick five. We can okay, make we'll five. take a quick five minute break and we'll return for the Executive Officer's Report. Quick. Mr. Puglia. Excuse me. Um, that was bad timing on my part. I forgot that I was up next and I put a potato chip in my mouth. So, um, Anyhow, um, I want to uh, thank Sean and Taylor again for um, their presentations, and um, that makes uh, parts of my report very easy. And so, as usual, I'm sorry, I need to get to the right page here. Um, the items we'll be discussing are administration, licensing, enforcement, and budget. Um, and IT update, which um, two of the three have already been accomplished. Administration, um, the administrative unit, um, administration slash licensing unit, has a vacant um, management services technician position, which is a um, position that's uh, semi-clerical, semi-analytical. And um, we're still, we're leaving that vacant temporarily, but we do intend to fill that down the line. But um, right now, we're trying to cut costs wherever we can. Um, our, um, one of our current employees, uh, Natalie Boyer, has um, accepted the, the new, newly created. It's not a new position for the board, but we've, we've transferred uh, duties around and established a, a, a unique position. And um, Natalie has um, interviewed and been um, offered and accepted the position. And that's in the licensing unit. And I, we have a um, limited term staff services analyst pos um, position that we created to help us out through um, some transitions we're dealing with. And her name is Amanda Campbell. She's been helping out with continuing education. Um, she and um, Andrea McMillan, who's sitting in the back there, and um, our policy analyst, have been um, helping out with continuing education and um, helping to keep that moving along. So I want to thank both of them for their help with that. And 
the enforcement unit has a vacant analyst position. That's um, another one that we have vacant temporarily, but we, you know, we hope to fill those soon so that we can be performing optimally. We're, we're keeping up with all the work, and um, the staff's been amazing about keeping the level of service up with limited resources, but um, and we look forward to having a, a point in the near future where we'll have um, a full staff and be able to put time into special projects and uh, priorities. So um, I don't right, know if anybody I, has any questions. Can I ask a question real yeah. quick? Will Natalie be able to uh, keep, she was helping the CE? Um, yes, um, she, she is, she, she will continue to have a hand in CE and, um, she's, um, she's, um, she's on a break. Um, so I, I don't want to discuss an employee's personal, visit, but she's, uh, you know, while she's away from the office, she'll be coming back, um, in a couple of months. Um, so other staff is um, filling in and, you know, so we're moving things around and um, most of the transition should go unnoticed, but, um, but we have. Her new position, she'll still be the contact yeah. person for this. Yeah. She'll maintain those duties, yes. Yeah, sorry, I um, So, okay, um, and then we have licensing and enforcement, which I'm um, going to turn first over to Dixie Van Allen for the licensing update. Um, any? Um, thank you. Am I talking into it? Okay. <laughs> um, as for the licensing trends, um, we are still continuing to see a downward trend in the number of chiropractic licensees. It's a very slight um, dip from last month. Um, we've decreased by seven. Um, overall, um, through the month of November, our, our number of applications received have gone down a little bit, but December and January are typically high volume months. So in your next um, board report, you should see an increase in those numbers of applications received and the number of licenses issued. Um, and then we'll be able to tell with a full six months, you know, if this trend is going to continue to move downwards or if we're going to start going back up a little bit again. Um, I don't have any statistics on our, um, on our CE audits. Um, it's been a very busy time at the office, and so we haven't had a lot of staff um, to cover that responsibility, but I do hope to have a full report on um, the number of audits that we've completed and, um, and where we're at with the um, compliance rate on those. At the next board. And I, I just want to add that um, although we've slowed down, staff from throughout the office, including management staff, have been helping out with um, um, looking at reviewing the audits and um, processing them. And so we've been able to um, keep up pretty well. You know, we're not uh, doing them as quickly as we would like, but I want to thank um, the managers and the rest of the staff who've, um, who've participated in helping out with those to keep that process moving. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions about licensing? No, I just would like to request once again, Dixie, that um, whether it's at the next meeting or meeting after that, that we get some stats on what's happening throughout the country again. That was great last time that we were provided that for all the different, um, I would say, not only throughout the country, but also the different licensing boards in California. And that, that it, research is being um, conducted right now, and so we were hoping to have um, information to report at this meeting, but definitely at the next meeting. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Zellino, I have a question. We provided it a couple times. Um, I think at some point I'd like to discuss with you and, and provide you with what we have and see um, how we can improve on the data that we've already collected. 
And, I then thought, I, and then I know specifically um, I wanted to wait until after the first of the year to reach out to the state of Florida because I know that was one of the states that was identified that it has an upward trend as far as um, more licensees. And I want to kind of reach out to them and see if there are certain things that are going on as far as things that they're doing as a board or it might be something with the, the association in Florida. So it would be interesting to get a little bit more data as far as what that state is doing differently than what we're doing here in California. So that's, some, that's a project that we'll be embarking on between now and the next board meeting. Thank you. Um, in regards to your first question, I think the data that you provided already was sufficient. I think it's just important for us to know if our numbers are going down to compare those to all the other healthcare specialties in California and furthermore to compare those to all the other chiropractors in the country, all well, the other states, I should say. And I think that the um, only addition that we discussed last time that I'm sure continues to be an interest for us all is adding PAs as a part of that informational packet. Okay, um, so um, Kristen Walker, our enforcement manager, will provide an enforcement update. Sure. Um, so looking at the meeting packet, uh, the first item under the enforcement update is our enforcement statistics table. Um, what that table represents for the current fiscal year is just about halfway. It's current as of um, late December. Um, looking at the number of complaints received, we're at 416, and I'd like to note that that includes over half of those are um, the counterpart of when people fail a CE audit, it becomes an enforcement case. So we're looking at over 200 of that is purely made up of CE audits. Um, looking at the numbers halfway through the year, we've already closed um, over four over 400 cases. So we're we look pretty good as far as um, our enforcement unit and getting rid of the pending cases and really making sure that we're carrying through um, with taking action. Also looking at um, the manner in which we're closing cases, you'll see that um, letter of admonishments have increased pretty substantially over the last five fiscal years. Um, we've been using that as a, we find that to be a very effective tool to educate licensees with more minor violations where we're not taking any formal action, we're not finding them. We are putting them on notice that they've um, violated the law with respect to whether it's CE or record keeping. There's things in the records that they're failing to record. Um, so we've been using that as a tool. Um, we've also been using citations for more minor violations that are above the level of the letter of admonishment. Um, taking a look at accusations filed, we filed eight so far this year. Um, I expect to see that number probably double by the end of the year. Um, we've had some disciplinary cases that have closed, and we have quite a few that are still pending that are making their way through. Um, another thing to note, looking at... Um, where the numbers are as of now, looking at our active probation cases are, have been trending down as you look at the last five fiscal years. Um, what we're finding is we're getting some repeat offenders. So they're either exiting through revocation or um, we've also been seeing a lot more of um, voluntary surrenders of licenses rather than um, being put on probation. So that's been another thing that's been going down. Um, some of those numbers as well are people that have served their probationary period and now have a full and active license. Um, so. Are there any questions about that table or I have a question. Um, I don't know if it's strictly actually yes it is. Um, sorry. Regarding the total fines assessed, do you have the data on fines assessed versus fines collected? Uh, we we can get that. If yeah, if that's something that you'd like included in the packet, we can include that. Um, we're very successful in collecting the fines. Mm -hmm. Um we collect the majority of them, and if somebody doesn't pay, we refer them to the Franchise Tax Board to intercept any type of tax refund that they might have. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, um, so you know, for the questions, I, I just want to um, wrap up by thanking uh, Dixie and Kristen and Marcus um, for helping out. Um, for, they do a tremendous job in the office. And um, and also they keep me together here at these meetings because there's a lot of moving parts at a at a board meeting and I appreciate them stepping in and um, and helping with a lot of the details and um, making me look good, which is hard to do. So thank you all. <laughs> thank you, Robert. Thank you, Dixie. Thank you, Kristen. Any public comment? Hearing none. Uh, 
we've already gone through agenda item 16 budget fund condition update and the information technology update moving to agenda item 18 update discussion and possible action on pending rulemaking I just like to inform the board that staff are currently working on the rulemaking file uh, for the CE requirements and um, we have also been working on the uniform standards and disciplinary guidelines and that's something that we've been uh, doing actively so I want to let you know um, additionally the CPI uh, and delegation of authority to the AO uh, rulemaking files um, are in the initial phase of DCA's regulatory review process. So uh, that would correspond to step five on, I believe it's under, let's see, the initial phase um, sheet in the board meeting packet. So that would correspond to step five. So that's all I, all I have for now. Before we move on, I just want to um, maybe get an update from legal counsel. We've submitted a couple of packages, and if you could speak to maybe some of the things that you're currently currently reviewing, or what state of review they're in. Okay, I think. And also, one more thing: can you also um, the board has not been informed about the changes in legal, and so can you, if you can, speak briefly to the changes in legal and the adoption or the establishment of the new regulatory I, I, I can I can thank you uh, so the legal affairs division has established a new unit a uh, unit for uh, regulations development and review and the gentleman who is assigned to this board is uh, Clay Jackson he really wanted to be here today but he had an engagement that required him to be away from the office. <clears throat> Excuse me. I believe he'll be here to meet you at the uh, next regular meeting. Uh, the, the idea is that this regulatory unit will both do regulatory reviews on behalf of the department and also assist board councils with regulatory work as, as well. So in that vein, the I can tell you in terms of the the packages that we currently have, which is which is a denial of application, revocation, or suspension of licensure, that 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 has been um, um, that's currently being looked at by the regs the regulatory unit, as well as the consumer protection enforcement initiative, and the disciplinary guidelines. It's the delegation of, uh, of authority item, forgive me. So, so those three items are being reviewed by the regulatory unit right now. That's great. And that should be step, step number five, um, the initial uh, phase uh, related to DCA's as a regulatory review process. Any discussion? Any public comment? I'm sorry, David. I just oh, wanted to please. say um, quickly that the that the tracking sheet and worksheet has been very helpful. Thank you guys very much for doing that. It's really kind of lays it out for us because it it can be because we have so many things going on. It can be very confusing. So I really appreciate that. Uh, thanks. Well, that's been helpful. Thank you, Andrea. On to agenda item 19 any public comment for items not on the agenda hearing none oh, yeah. um, On to agenda item number 20 and Dr. McLean under future agenda items. 
So um, I just wanted to say, as one of the members who have served here with um, the, the members who are leaving, I don't consider Dr. Azzolino and Dr. Dane as leaving, so uh, I think that we're going to hold them here whether they like it or not. But um, as far as Dr. Lickman is concerned, I just wanted to say that it's been a pleasure serving with you um, and um, battling with you regarding food. Um, but um, I really appreciate all that um, that you've brought to us. And I have a little something for you. That's um, from um, a new company called Jay's Cookie, my son. And since, oh. since Corey is our, you have to share our, our resident foodie, I thought that you would appreciate those. Just take note of gluten free when my time comes. <laughs> he does gluten free as well, just so you know. No, because I know you don't. You're, yeah, you want all the gluten. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Um, for I actually have some future agenda items. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, regarding um, real business, regarding. Um, other future agenda items, I wanted to recommend or suggest um, to the chair that we um, uh, add to the uh, agenda a discussion on the approval of disciplinary monitors and um, our process with that, that we have a, a discussion about that. I'd like to also add to the agenda so we can get an update, Michael, on the corporate naming situation. I know we're inquiring about that. I uh, did, did an update for you at the meeting in San Diego. Are there, is there follow-up research that you'd like or? Uh, I thought we were going to explore further on um, whether we needed to keep that statute or um, repeal it so that we're on par with all okay. the other health care providers. But if that's not necessary, then. Well, we can certainly put the item um, back on the agenda, and I'm happy to help. Um, we can certainly talk after the meeting, or I can talk with Mr. Polio, and we'll decide where we need to go. Thank you. Absolutely. We need to go to closed session. Any other future agenda items, discussion, any public comment? Hearing none, uh, we are going to go into executive session. And yeah, and the meeting will be adjourned after, um, but there will no, there won't be any additional public um, items on the agenda. So uh, anybody who um, isn't in closed session, there's no need to stay unless you like the building and want to hang out in the lobby. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And